number 10, not bathing. Let's start off strong. So obviously hindsight is 2020. We know a lot of more about personal hygiene now than we did, you know, then and as well in like middle school because high school locker rooms, what the heck. Without the knowledge of germs and disease, not bathing seemed like the logical next step for a lot of people, even though it made you smelly as all heck. When the pilgrims arrived in Native America on the Mayflower, the indigenous tribes often referred to their horrid smell. An account from a member of the Patuax Nation even tried to convince them to start washing themselves. They were like, come on guys, it's enough. They washed their hands and faces, but they rarely washed their whole bodies. Though they believed cleanliness was next to godliness, that didn't necessarily mean they needed water to do it. They believed that should they submerge themselves, they risk disease. This could be because they dumped their daily duties into the water, so you know, that's, that's likely. So instead they took dry baths where they wiped themselves down with a dry cloth. But this, that it, it didn't really help much. Number nine, bedpans. It's always the worst when you get tucked in at night, you start to fall asleep, you're starting to doze off, and then you realize you need to pee. It's the worst. You gotta get up, walk down that long, scary hallway, blind yourself for two minutes, and then get cozy all over again. Well, in the Middle Ages, you would just toss your full bedpan out the window. Easy peasy, heads up. Oh, oops, <laughs> it's so gross. Or sometimes, if you're feeling a little lazy, this was also common, you would use the bedpan and then just slide it back underneath your bed and go right back to sleep. If anybody ever gives you shit for having cups in your room, show them this video, show them this history. You're fine, you're not that bad. Back in those days, we weren't exactly aware of the disease that we threw out the window as well. Most of the time it was number one, so the rain could just, you know, wash away the yuck. But these buildings were only one story. There wasn't, it wasn't going anywhere. If you were tossing anything out, you'd be stepping over it the next morning on the way to, you know, the public execution or whatever. Number eight, a lead facial. Today, if you have tan skin from that hot summer glow, it implies that you have had enough leisure time to acquire such a hue. Getting a tan is the thing, unless you're like me and slather on that sunscreen for health. And so you look like a newborn baby when you're 80 years old. However, it was the opposite in times of old. If you had sun-kissed skin, that meant you worked hard in the fields, a symbol that you were a peasant or of lower class. If you were rich, you tended to have much paler skin, therefore implying your status. But simply staying out of the sun wasn't enough. Elizabeth I used a combination of lead and vinegar to achieve a bright white complexion and to hide her smallpox scars. The compound was called ceruse. This tradition even goes all the way back to women in the Roman Empire. Empire. A well known actress named Kitty Fisher was also said to have died from the material as it slowly poisoned her with daily use. The material would add blisters, so she put more on to cover it up. Same with Elizabeth, and yes, slowly you understand. Number seven, Victorian Laundry Day. You spill some mustard on your shirt today, that stain will be gone by the time you get home. We're pretty advanced when it comes to quick stain removal today, but like the Romans, which I'll talk about later, it wasn't always smooth sailing. Take the 18th century, for example, when Laundry Day came around, it was an event. It was like an ultimate chore. They had to take daylight in consideration and plan their washing days, as in more than one. The Victorian era was exhausting. They would soak their clothes overnight, then the next day would be spent soaping them up, boiling them, rinsing, soaping again, rinsing again, maybe soap one more in case you know there's too much pee-pee, and then rinsed another time, wrung out, mangled, laid out to dry, hence the sunlight timing, starched and then slowly ironed. Cut to today, we have to encourage adults not to eat Tide Pods or drink bleach. We'll get there, maybe, I don't know. Number six, wigs and makeup. When you don't bathe, and are overall just smelly, you're gonna need to do something to cover up whatever the heck is building up beneath that bodice. Wigs would have never become as popular if it weren't for a very specific venereal disease called syphilis. By 1580, the STD was the worst epidemic since the Black Death. Patients clogged hospitals and without antibiotics or protection, things got pretty nasty. Sores, blindness, rashes, dementia, and patchy hair loss. Thus, for the sake of keeping up appearances, wigs came into fashion. Also the makeup I mentioned before. Balding was a huge humiliation, so they made wigs out of horse, goat, and or human hair. They also cover the wigs in powdered, scented with lavender or orange to hide any foul odors, and as we suspect, there were a lot of foul odors. They weren't stylish until 1655 when the King of France started losing his hair and had 48 wigs made. Then five years later, his cousin Charles II of England joined the train and suddenly powdered wigs became like the next best thing. Wigs did help curb the lice problem though because the human hair had to be shaved in order for the perukes to be worn, but the wigs themselves had to be deloused often. 
and yeah. Number five, cancer treatment. All right, the big C. Cancer is something that obviously very is you know very prevalent in our modern society, and because of the rising rates, it makes us ask ourselves: Did cancer exist in ancient times? If so, where was it recorded? While they didn't call it cancer, it definitely did. Some of the earliest evidence of cancer is found in ancient manuscripts. Mummies, fossilized bone tumors that have been found in ancient Egypt specifically. There are tons of examples and different forms of cancer that have been found throughout. Perhaps the oldest comes from 3000 BC. And it was found, like I said, in the Edwin Smith papyrus that we talked about before. Now in this text, it describes eight cases of tumors or ulcers of the breast and how they treated them back then, or at least tried to. See, back then these tumors were removed by cauterization using a tool called a fire drill. Other than this though, the text says in reference to the illness that there is no treatment. So in ancient times and today, we're still trying to figure this one out. Number four, tooth extraction. You may not think of surgery when you talk about tooth extraction, but this for sure counts as surgery. This, yeah, I've had a tooth pulled. It's pretty, it's pretty intense. Every time something gets removed from your body, I'm gonna count that. And if there's definitely blood involved, yeah, I'm gonna count that. Getting a tooth pulled is still so barbaric. Even today, they don't like slice a line and then gently slide the tooth out or anything surgical. No, they just have two dentists grab your tooth at the same time, put their foot up, and then yank it out. I was numb, sure, but it was still weird, okay? Back in the day, pulling teeth was done not to make room for braces, but to solve any problem, or well, all problems, regarding your teeth. Yeah, cavity, gone. Tooth egg, bleh, see ya. Oh, some plaque, no problem. <laughs> Today, we're lucky to have x-rays and modern technology, you know, to tell us if a, a tooth is coming in sideways or which ways. But back then, some believed that it was tooth worms. Yeah, this feeling over here could be a worm. Go get it checked out. Could have worms in your head. Gross. Aristotle and Hippocrates wrote about dentistry around 500 BC, and the way they would handle tooth decay or extraction was by using metal wires to fix wobbly teeth or even a broken jaw aka ancient braces. Number three, trepanation. One of history's oldest surgeries. Trepanation was also, it was, it was the worst, it was horrible. To this day, we're not even sure why this was a thing, but we picked up a few ideas along the way. Let's talk about it. Turning the clocks back to thousands of years ago, trepanation was the practice of drilling holes into your skull. A popular theory is that trepanation was done to release evil spirits. Yeah, let's drill some holes in our skull and see if our mental illness just goes away. That'll help. As barbaric as this sounds, skulls found in Peru hint that this procedure wasn't as fatal as you'd first guess. The reason this would happen was also to clear out bone fragments after skull fractures, right? So you show up with a headache and leave with a hole in said head. But honestly, the fact that you're leaving at all is surprising, given the time. They didn't have any advanced medical instruments, but they did have sharp ones. This was the first surgical procedure, it was around 6,500 BC. The term trepanation comes from the Greek term trepanon, borer to, you know, to drill. Number two, rotting whale body. Okay, not all these are not disgusting. One of the most strange things on display at the Australian National Maritime Museum exhibit has got to be the whale carcass treatment. This is an odd treatment. Now the cure for rheumatism back in the 19th century was to crawl inside of a dead whale's body and uh, yeah, just hang out for a bit. And by a bit, I mean a full 30 hours. After that point, you would definitely be healed for at least 12 months. Yeah, it began in the town of Eden, obviously a whaling town on the southern coast of Australia. Only while this was happening, it was kind of funny, the user's head would be poking out of the whale. Yeah, like the world's worst sleeping bag, all tucked in there, getting better. It all started when an intoxicated man stumbled into a dead whale body, passed out, and then when he woke up, his rheumatism was cured, just like that. Yeah, from pale ales to pale whales. No more achy joints for you, my friend, let's do it. And finally, number one. Egyptian nose job. Plastic surgery is more widespread now than it ever has been before, but it's all because it started a long time ago, especially in the ages of the ancient Egyptians. In the Edwin Smith papyrus, along with the documentation of trauma surgeries, bone fractures, fixes, and all that jazz, this text also shows examples of fixes for nasal injuries, which I gotta kinda seek. I have to seek some of that right now. I think I need to get my nose fixed. Can't breathe a lot. The treatment involved manipulating the nose into the desired position before using wooden splints or lint or swabs, anything really to hold it into place. You know, it's an ancient nose job. That's crazy, right? It's truly wild to think back about how much, you know, these people had shaped our world and lives, especially our medical world today. While so much of the civilization still remains a mystery to us, right? It's crazy how much we still know and how much we still don't know. Kicking off our list at number 10. Seam squirrels. I love squirrels. Being Canadian, we see quite a bit of them. They're a little too friendly for me at times, but they're great. During the Old West era, seam squirrels were, well, 
not what you think. Personal hygiene was not a priority for many people back then, obviously, and lice infestations were unfortunately quite common. Now, the type of lice that affected people during this time was commonly known as body lice, which is pretty horrible. That could be found in the seams of clothing, hence the term seam squirrels. Yeah, not actually a squirrel at all. It's just body lice. Gotcha. Body lice, of course, was a major problem during the Old West era, and they were responsible for the spread of diseases like typhus, trench fever, and relapsing fever. Relapsing fever? I haven't even heard of that one. That's terrible. These diseases were often fatal because, you know, ye old West, and many people in the Old West succumbed to them. To combat the spread of lice and the, you know, one of many diseases that they carried, people in the Old West often resorted to extreme measures, such as burning their clothing or even shaving their heads completely. That's why you see old cowboys and they look like they're stressed. They have no hair, their clothes are just gone. You're like, what happened? Lice, lice happened. Some people also used remedies like vinegar and kerosene to try and kill the lice, so. Yeah, it was a rough time, either way. Overall, lice infestations were a significant health concern during the Old West era, and they played a significant role in the spread of disease. Yeah, it wasn't just rats in the medieval era, it was also lice, which is even grosser, in my opinion. Number nine, Old West Dental. I could use some Old West Dental recently. I got a, I'm chewing on one side right now, you know what I mean? In the Old West, dental hygiene was not a priority for everyone. They couldn't afford it. And also, dental care was often very sparse. You couldn't really find it anywhere, for that matter. People generally didn't have access to modern dental tools or products, and many did not have regular access to any dentists at any point in their life, which is a sad but real fact. That would suck, I'm terrified. However, there were some basic dental hygiene practices that people in the Old West may have followed to keep their teeth, you know, somewhat in their heads, you know, keep their gums not rotten. Didn't do much, but did something. There were toothbrushes. Not many, but you know, wasn't as good as Oral B. There was some stuff. More often than not, you'd have to use twigs or chew on mint, that kind of natural survivor stuff. Some people may have also used a cloth or a rag to rub their teeth clean. Yeah, don't forget your tooth cloth before you go on vacation, I guess. You gotta and put it back in your pocket. Your old woody teeth, gotta rub those. Access to professional dental care was limited in the Old West. Some towns, some, had dentists, but all they did back then was just pull out the problem. They didn't give you a crown. They're like, which one hurts? All right, get out of here. All without anesthesia. So that's a great time. You're gonna remember all of it. Other options included a community toothbrush, which is hilarious to think about and also so sad. Yeah, some public establishments had a public toothbrush. Can you imagine? Go out, have a little brush, check your teeth. All right, cool. I'm gonna go back to the bar. I'm gonna be sick. I'm gonna actually throw up right now. Number eight, no spitting. Spitting was a common habit back in the Old West. You see it in movies and parodies. They're always spitting on the ground and stuff. Well, it's because it's real. It's a real fact right there. It wasn't a officially outlawed, however, many towns and cities did prohibit spitting on sidewalks and inside of public buildings, because, yeah, please don't do that. Thank you so much, sir. This was largely due to concerns about hygiene and, of course, like I said earlier, the spread of disease. In addition, spitting was considered rude and uncivilized behavior. Yeah, of course, and many people were offended by it. Middle of conversation, guy just spits in between your feet. I'm like, wait, don't do that. Please don't do that ever again. Some businesses even had signs asking customers to not spit on the floor. Can you imagine what kind of sh hole you're in? You have to ask people not to do that. There was also social norms in place that discouraged spitting in certain situations. For example, it was considered impolite to spit in the presence of a woman or in formal settings, which, yeah, I agree, still do that today. That's great. Despite these efforts to discourage spitting, it remained a common practice among cowboys, miners, and other workers in ye old West. They're like, yeah, I have sh in my mouth. I don't know. We don't have water. I'm going to spit. Sorry. Number seven, communal towels. Ugh, this one's so rough. It's exactly exactly what you think it is. It was a ride. Today we have paper towels that you pump like 13 times just to get a little sheet. Or sometimes, if you're lucky, that Dyson air drying thing where you just dip your hands in for like 13 seconds and then it's done. You're like, oh, the future is here. That's always fun, that one. Back in the Old West, communal towels were often used in public restrooms and other shared spaces. Yeah, just one towel for all. Just a dap off everything that's wet or damp back then, ew. These towels were usually made of cloth and hung on a rack for multiple people to use just in public, like it's your bathroom. While this may seem unhygienic by our modern standards now, it was a common practice at the time. So yeah, I don't know, we can laugh a bit, I guess. People were generally less concerned about the spread of germs and diseases back then, and communal towels were convenient, and they were a cost-effective option for public spaces. However, with the rise of awarenesses about hygiene and germs and all that nasty stuff, the use of these towels Towels eventually fell out of favor in the earliest 20th century. Thank God. Imagine dapping off your lips after eating some wings with a communal towel. Some cowboy just, you know, huh, 
and then he, uh, and then, uh, 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 and then you come in and wipe your, that's so gross. Number six, hair care? Yeah, I added a question mark there because, I don't know, not much TLC going on on top back then. Throughout history, people have used a variety of natural ingredients for hair care. Nowadays, guys have it too easy. It's like Axe five in one. It's like hair, armpits, legs, feet, all in my, there's no way you can do all of that. Popular methods in the Old West were whiskey and castor oil. Yep, all on your big exposed head, right in the sun, there you go. Pantene Pro-V wasn't a thing then, so folks were rubbing their heads clean with castor oil, that's a nightmare. Whiskey was believed to help cleanse the scalp and often promote hair growth, while the castor oil, that option, that was thought to moisturize and condition the hair, so that'd be a fun two-in-one back then, that's great, put that in the stocking. These ingredients were readily available and most importantly, they were affordable, making them popular, but also realistically, it was their only option. The guys doing whiskey, he's like, yeah, let's clean it up, clean it up top. It's so hot. It's like, ugh, really burns. Number five, crocodile done the deed. Again, I'm saying this again. Who had the gall? Who had the damn audacity to look at a steaming pile of, of digested animal excrement and go, you know, that will work for? Insert problem here. Once again, I put the question, how the heck did we survive? But nevertheless, we are here once again to bring to you yet another animal poop cure-all. And this time it was for contraception. Yes, in ancient Egypt, women would use crocodile dung as a contraceptive. Yay! Now, crocodiles were worshipped and sacred to the ancient Egyptians, so that could be one reason why they thought it would help. They would mix it with sour milk. Sour milk? <sighs> to make it a pasty kind of poop dough with a hope that would create an acidic barrier to sperm. Kind of like a dungy version of a diaphragm or a cap used today, but covered in spermicide. We had to start somewhere, but I honestly can't think of a better way to kill the mood. Hold on, honey. Gotta shove some poop up there. Number four, sulfur for freckles. Ooh, this next one gets me hot. This next one just hits too close to home. Sorry, frecklers. I love my freckles. Every summer they pop harder and harder, better, faster, and stronger. I love them. But back in the day, there were some pretty insane methods to get rid of them. I know, get rid of them. How could you, right? How dare you? Having freckles in ancient Roman days meant you couldn't participate in your favorite magical rituals. <laughs> Yeah, sorry Balthazar, I'll catch the next meeting I guess. I'm gonna go wash up. Having freckles meant you were impure or polluted. And in ancient Greece, having a beauty mark or a thousand on your face or cheek meant a bright future was in store for you. So, depends really where I am, but kinda, I'm like, huh? Medieval Europe, moles or freckles meant that you were for sure a witch. Great. That one, they're kinda, they're, they're onto something a little bit. They got witchy vibes. Ancient China, if you had a red or black mole, that was actually a good sign, but a brown mole, like this one, meant grave warning signs. E. So depending where and when you were, that freckle that you named when you were seven could have possibly changed your entire life. In places where freckles weren't desirable, sulfur was used daily to get rid of them. We don't recommend lathering your face with sulfur. In fact, I think magical rituals are safer. Number three, Versailles and other palaces. Did anyone else imagine when they were a kid that they were born in the wrong era and should have been like prouncing around in golden embroidered gowns and palaces or being in a masquerade decked in velvet across the room from your secret lover? <sighs> Some more than most. Except there is a lot missing from that fantasy, specifically the smell. You'd think a place like Versailles with like halls of mirrors and lots of gold everywhere would be like the cleanest place to live in the 18th century, but the reality was stomach churning. Remember that red velvet dress? Well that hadn't been washed in god knows how long and you were stuffed in a room with people wearing the same thing and everywhere was a toilet. That's right, nobles didn't wait to empty themselves in a chamber pot or bathroom of some kind. Versailles was their toilet. They would relieve themselves in empty fire pits, imagine if it was occupied, in the stairwell, behind doors, wherever they felt. Sounds too ridiculous to be true? Well, take this 1675 report of the Louvre Palace in Paris and I quote, on the grand staircases, behind the doors, and almost everywhere one sees, there are a mass of excrement, one smells a thousand unbearable stenches caused by calls of nature, which everyone goes to do there every day." Unquote. Things got so bad in other palaces, Henry VIII even had to decree that cooks in the royal kitchen were forbidden to work naked. Why were they working naked? I don't know. Or in garments of such vileness as they do. So as for my first point, I think I was born in precisely the right era. Number two, finger food. You ever go to somebody's house for dinner and they have like 
15 forks laying in front of you, just way too many utensils for no reason. That's why I like nachos, okay? It's not intimidating. Burgers aren't intimidating. You can just eat with your hands and get messy. It's easier. It's way more fun as well just to dive in and make an absolute mess. Like medieval times, for example, they had cutlery, but you had to be somebody fancy to have it. Most of the population, being poor and all, had to eat with their hands. Chopsticks were first used during the Shang Dynasty, the oldest chopsticks ever found went as far back as 3000 BC. But come 400 AD, China's population spiked, resulting in a lack of resources for food. These stirring sticks now got a lot smaller to fit for their smaller portions, and that was the start of chopsticks. Fun fact. Come the 16th century, the rich and fancy carried their own set of forks with them to their royal dinner. King Charles V of France had a vault, a vault with a few forks in it. He's like, hey, check this one out. Bing. That's how rare that kind of metal work was back in medieval times. I bring plastic forks to work. Does that count for something? I have like two in my backpack, maybe three. Number one, and last but not least, a gong farmer. Adding to that fantasy I spoke about earlier, living in a castle with a glistening, sparkling moat. What moat could you want? Well, I'm sorry to say that moats often doubled as toilets. Very often when castles were built, the toilets would be built high up in the castle hanging over the moat so that it would just drop right in there. But another way they would deal with their droppings was to build a toiletry over a cesspit, kind of like an outhouse, or kind of exactly like an outhouse. Except at one point, the cesspit would fill up, enter the hero of the hour. Today, we have people with machines who do it, Somebody actually had to go in there and do it himself with their bare hands. Friends, remove your hats in honor of the gong farmer. Their job was to get on in there, shovel it out by hand, and ferry it to a spot where they could bury it. It was a dangerous job for a multitude of reasons. The top ones including the pits were often riddled with disease, and they were often quite deep. So as a result, they were paid very well for the time to sweeten the fact that no one would go near them, so they would be forever alone. But even then, lives were lost. One man by the name of Richard the Raker fell into one and drowned. What a way to go. Number 10 is chloroform the hiccups away. Nowadays we know a nasty case of hiccups is curable by just holding your breath or chugging a bunch of water. But if this was 1899, you'd be prescribed chloroform. Known by many as the mysterious liquid on the rag placed over the, someone's face to make them faint in many period pieces or cartoons, chloroform gained popularity after Queen Victoria demanded its usage during her labor in 1853, after having been denied it in her previous labors. By taking these lengths to reduce the annoyance of hiccups, your vital organs may pay a steep price. Chloroform has the potential to damage the nervous system, lungs, and trachea, as well as the liver and kidney when exposed long term. This is just one of many medical remedies that we'll be covering from the first Merrick Manual of Diagnosis and Therapy, the oldest continuously published English language medical textbook. All the quack treatments in our list today used to be found in this mass encyclopedia. For instance, number 9 in our countdown is smoke inhalation for asthma and other lung conditions. This may be one of the more counter intuitive remedies on our list, as it's easy to see now that smoke is not beneficial for asthma at all. Through the late 19th and into the next, however, inhaling smoke or smoke, as well as stramonium, a hallucination inducing nightshade, as well as lobelia, known for its sedative properties, were popular treatments for asthmatics. Asthma is caused when your airways can narrow or swell while producing excess mucus. Smoking meanwhile has been shown to eventually reduce the number of cilia, the lungs filaments which help transport mucus into the lungs, which only leads to the worsening of asthma symptoms. This wasn't the only weird tobacco smoke belief however, in 1872 an English newspaper talked of tobacco smoke enemas which even reported that hundreds of lives might have been spared by the tobacco smoke enema. Okay. Weird enough. Plasters, no not the British word for band-aids, is number 8. This medical treatment was said to have sucked the badness out of a person. They were like a nicotine patch made up of a thin layer sheet of wax as well as leather and it was able to stick onto the skin. In the wax there were remedies such as lead, opium, frankincense, tobacco, etc. This mix would be applied while still warm to ensure the adhesion of the plaster. Plasters were sold to anyone of any age and came in many different shapes and sizes so that they may be applied to different areas. Areas. What were they used for? Everything. 
cough, cold, period pain, organ failure, alcoholism, headache, the list can go on forever. Seeing as they wanted the patch to pull as much badness from the body as possible, these patches could be left on for 2 days to 2 weeks to forever. Without washing of course. Naturally these patches trapped in a lot of moisture that could cause infections, blisters, rashes and hives underneath especially once the patch is removed and the skin is finally exposed to air. Arsenic like plasters was a cure all and it's number 7 in the countdown. If you've seen our other video, top 10 unusual fashion trends from the Victorian era, you might know that arsenic was in everything in the Victorian era. Makeup, wallpaper, dye. No exception was made in medicine either as arsenic was prescribed for anything from anemia in Merrick's diagnosis manual to anthrax, cancer, reduced libido, syphilis, or even cholera. While it was most popular to consume arsenic, it could also be inhaled or injected. Being a byproduct of smelting, it's no wonder arsenic was everywhere during the industrial revolution as there was an excess of it. So it was incredibly accessible and a household remedy. Since doctors already prescribed it to do so much, everyday people just start to use it to treat any common ailment. Unsurprisingly, many people suffered arsenic poisoning symptoms. The ailments are now referred to as Fowler's disease. Number 6 is all kinds of gross and questionable. The everlasting pill. When the Merck manual was first published, part of the comprehensive treatment plan for an eruptive fever, which is a classification for diseases like scarlet fever, smallpox, and chickenpox, was actually laxatives. Castor oil was the main laxative choice for Victorians up until the debut of the everlasting pill, made up of a metal now known to be toxic called antimony, would be invented. Swallowing this would induce severe vomiting and diarrhea, thus giving the body what they thought to be a healthy cleanse, and their intention was to purge diseases from the body. It earned the name the everlasting pill, as the pill would pass through the gastric system mostly intact, meaning it could be retrieved and cleaned for future use. Seeing as the metal was greatly valuable at the time, it was quite common to keep it in the family and hand it down generation to generation. Generation. Imagine getting that in your granny's will. Number five, cesspools. Ooh, gross transition. If you're gonna make a massive castle, you need to know where to build certain rooms. Like say over a cesspool for an example, that might be important. Just plug your nose. Cesspools were often placed under floors, which makes sense, cause you know, you, you poop and then gravity and everything goes down. But you need to make sure that those floors are supportive enough. Because in 1183, the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire had a dinner in the palace of Erfurt, but the floor in the main hall broke open, resulting in a bunch of dinner guests falling through the floor, with a few of them even drowning in that cesspool. What a horrible way to go. Then again, in 1326 England, Richard the Raker had just sat down for dinner, guy hasn't even started his meal yet, and then again, the floor broke and he fell through and drowned. I'd say chamber pots were safer, definitely, but when it comes to waste, honestly, just out of sight, out of mind. Just get that away from me. Literally, pun intended. Number four, towels. I'm pretty picky when it comes to towels. I always have to have way too many just ready to go at all times. You know, in case I want a bath, in case I want to have two baths in a row, you never know. Today we have nicer towels at hotels than anything, honestly. We all know somebody with a Bahia Principe resort towel in their closet, and you're like, really? Really, you thief? Okay, I'm telling. Around the 1800s, flour sack towels were the best you'd get. Now, around this time, suppliers were packaging flour and other foods in these cotton sacks. This saved big time on barrels, and eventually they were cut into tea towels. Now, come the Great Depression, resources were of course limited, so these flour sacks were used now for multiple reasons. Clothing, toys, quilts, pillowcases, diapers, and of course, towels. Wouldn't feel too good on your back, not at all. Number three, same clothes, new day. King James, and no, I don't mean LeBron, I mean King James VI of Scotland this time around. We'll talk about him another time. He had a pretty sweet idea when it came to changing clothes. You don't. Simple as that. What a dream, right? The amount of times I change my shirt every day for literally no reason, it's such a waste of time. It's like black, mm, gray, mm, black. Yeah, that's it. It's a waste of time. King James would wear the same clothes for months at a time, even wearing the same hat for 24 hours straight. He was devoted to the hat game. He just slept like, didn't move a muscle. He went as far as not bathing either because he thought that it was bad for his health. Yeah, things were thought differently back then, as you may have known by now on this channel. James became king when he was just 13 months old and he succeeded Mary, Queen of Scots. In 1603, he took over as ruler for both England, Scotland, and Ireland for 22 years. And he looked the same every day. Gotta, gotta love it. Who's committed? Number two, unwanted hair. Pubic hair is a biological mystery, and yes, even after we hit puberty, we still can't figure it out. 
What are you? What's going on? So far, we believe this is part of our evolutionary history and it comes from a time where we needed fur all over our bodies, right? Like animals. We evolved to protect ourselves against the cold and just in general to keep that area, you know, safe. I don't know why I did that sound, but it's safe. So why is it that ancient Greek statues of women are completely hairless? Well, this was a time where if a woman's area was hair free, for some reason, the Greeks symbolized it as being pure. Okay. So in order to be considered pure, you'd have to use razors and creams, pumice stones, methods that were not as smooth as today. What's even more annoying is that men who would grow their body hair out, that was a sign of maturing. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not either of these categories. I can't grow anywhere where I want to. It's just bald, I'm just a bar of soap. Yeah, I'm not gonna use a stone to shave either. Thanks, we'll pass, next. And finally coming in at number one, acne. Ancient Egyptians and Greeks came up with an interesting method of getting rid of those pimples. Now reminder, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing. You ever click one of those videos and you're watching for like 40 minutes? You're like, I'm gonna be sick, is that yogurt? What is that? Physicians back then discussed these elevated spots with black tops that can plague your skin for four to five years. But by squeezing these mysterious spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were called maggots back then, so that's pretty horrible, that's gonna be in my head forever. They would refer to severe cases as maggots that lie in bed of roses, AKA your face, that's the bed of roses. If a physician told me I had maggots in my face, I'd faint. Teeth worms and maggots, like just brush your teeth and wash your face and then avoid all that smoke. These disorders were thought to be human skin taken on the properties of animals, so that's pretty wild. So ancient Greeks and Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds to solve that problem. Or what I just do is I just squeeze really hard, yell one curse word, and then wipe the mirror. That's usually how I do it. Kicking off our list at number 10, dental surgery. Back in the ancient Egyptian world, it's not like you could just take a quick trip to the dentist to get your teeth checked out and cleaned, yada yada, and then you go home, whatever, right? The diet of the average Egyptian was most definitely not exactly, you know, conductive to having an impeccable set of pearly whites. That's mostly due to the fact that the tools used to grind food would often leave traces of sand and or stone behind, which, you know, would naturally destroy your chiclets. And through documents found, there have been a few different dental treatments from that time that have been discovered. And it's pretty horrifying, like topical treatments and such. But one case was able to give us a glimpse into what is believed to be the treatment of an abscess, an ancient abscess, we love those. Even more interesting is a mummy that was found for the fourth dynasty. This mummy in his first molar was a bunch of surgically produced holes that they believe were used to drain an abscess, which clearly gives us some, you know, very tangible evidence that dental surgeries were in fact happening all those years ago. And before we head into the rest of this list, we also have to remember that all this was done or most of this was done without anesthetics, right? No one's gonna put you to sleep and then you wake up and you're like, oh, my teeth are gone, what happened? No, you were awake for the whole thing. It sucked. Number nine, Egyptian stitches. Yeah, gotta talk about Egyptians once again. I'm gonna talk about them quite a bit. They're the OGs. Just in general, while surgery did exist during ancient Egyptian times, invasive surgery wasn't quite as common because, well, obviously, like I just said, no painkillers, no antibiotics, the list goes on, right? No fun. One thing that's less invasive but still extremely important was seen quite a bit during these times. Use of stitches. Yeah, I've never needed any in my life, thank God, knock on. Knock on wood that I don't need any stitches. Ancient Egyptians found different and effective ways to make their own sutures in order to close these large wounds. They did so by using plant fibers or hair or tendons or wool threads, anything, right? In the oldest known surgical text, which is referred to now as the Edwin Smith Papyrus that came from ancient Egypt, there are 48 different cases of stitches being described. 48, imagine being one of those 48, that's kind of epic, not gonna lie. Number eight, blood transfusion. Back around 70 AD, the Romans were pretty wild when it came to the Colosseum and the games that would go on inside. There was uh, yeah, a lot of bloodshed and crowds would rush the arena after the day was done. Not to get autographs, but to hopefully, hopefully get a sip of that sweet gladiator blood. Yeah, blood back then was a magical elixir. And then near the early 1500s, blood was seen as this youth juice. Yeah, you drink some young blood as an elderly, and then those knees, your patellas, would apparently start working again. A lot of theories surrounding blood back then. And in the Middle Ages, bloodletting was a go-to when you were sick because they thought your humors were out of balance. It is so hot in this goddamn room. In 1628, blood circulation was discovered by a man named William Harvey. That changed the game, right? Now, the idea of something going into your bloodstream was in the picture hypothetically, that's a little odd. So we started to test this out on canines. Scientists were injecting them with different substances and slowly but surely that turned into blood transfusion between animals, between canines. So this is back in the 1660s, right? That's how early we started injecting things with blood, it's kind of gross. Number seven, cataract surgery. 
Okay, don't tell him I told you this, but Kyle, my brother Kyle, our other lovely co-host on B, is blind in one eye. Yep. Kyle was born with a cataract, but you would never know because he plays rugby amazingly and somehow he reads this tiny prompter. I can barely do it with two eyes. No idea how you do it, man. You're a champ. Cataract surgery is one of the oldest surgeries in the book. Well, rather, in the painting. It was found in a tomb in ancient Egypt. It was a painting of what is surely the oldest recorded eye surgery. Scientists are able to make this conclusion due to the length of the tool that the doctor is holding. They believed this was a method called couching, which happened to be recorded. See, the needle would push the cloudy lens to the bottom of the eye, ideally fixing their vision. The oldest tools found in Egypt tell us that 4,000 years ago, this was the first time it had been done. But afterwards, evidence of couching was found all over the world. Now, it wasn't until 1747 until Jacques Daniel, a doctor in France, he performed the first ever cataract extraction surgery in a modern sense. He was the OG. Every method sounds wildly uncomfortable. Have you been through this? Like Kyle has kudos. Number six, skin treatment. As soon as summer comes around, honestly, it's game over. I burn so easily. That's why I'm a fan of winter, right? I don't have to keep applying sunscreen to my face all day and feel like I'm about to faint. But how did ancient Egyptians beat the heat back in ancient times? They didn't have banana breeze SPF 35. No, ancient Egyptians valued their skin as a symbol of beauty. Yeah, you think your morning skin routine requires a lot of work? Buddy, read a book. Their routine was written on a tomb written on tomb walls and scrolls. They used rice bran containing UV absorbing gamma arisenol. Yeah, that was used to block the sun off. Jasmine as well helped repair sun damage. Ancient Greeks would use olive oil as sunscreen, which as far as UV protection goes, it did absolutely nothing. You're burnt and dehydrated, but also you look good, okay? Tan lines, I see you. In ancient times, singing Stutter by Mariana's Trench could have gotten you a hemiglossectomy, which is a word and a half right there. Sheesh. And speaking of half, that's exactly what they'd be cutting out, half of your tongue. Used today to treat oral cancers, hemi procedures can be credited to the Prussian surgeon J.F. Diefenbach, who in the early 18th century got the idea that maybe chopping out half of someone's tongue would stop their speech. Speech impediment. So he gave it a try, an incision cut through the root of the tongue that he said stopped the spasm of the vocal cords. Perhaps his patients stopped stuttering because they passed out or were screaming instead, seeing as this would be done without any painkillers. By the 1840s and going well into the 19th century, it was believed that this horrific surgery done without anesthesia was a radical cure. Needless to say, the treatment was not effective and sometimes patients died of blood loss. Today we have the American Speech Language Hearing Association sharing positive impact speech therapy can have over chopping off tongues. Are you prepared to squirm because they are? It's maggot therapy. Because since when have flies and open infectious wounds made a good pair? Apparently more often than we think. Don't get me wrong, we've all heard the Reddit horror stories. Finding a spider's nest in your ear canal or the cockroach nest under the super unbathed woman's, you know, breast. But if flies come out in a live, decontaminated larvae form during ancient medical procedure called meiosis, well, they've actually been curing infected wounds as far back as the Old Testament, as told in the book of job. In the American Civil War, doctors used maggot therapy to disinfect injured soldiers' wounds. Its simple mechanics and ability to promote speedy healing make the benefits of maggots handy in or out of battle. So what is it about maggots that bring even ruthless, cynical modern science to its knees still? For one, these bugs can dissolve up to 25 micrograms of necrotic tissue in under 24 hours, including infectious bacteria that burrow within. They're also self-limiting organisms. They can actually only attack dead flesh and they can't eat healthy, so no doctoral or patient fears of excessive tissue damage. It also means a patient should feel the maggots while eating them. While the practice is almost as old as time, maggot therapy was only approved by the FDA in 2004 as a single-use medical device that must be stored under sterile conditions and is biohazardous waste, similar to leeches. My male audience knows I'm bad for finding those terrible, testy-related torments and treatments. So here is your warning, because lithotomony is next. Ancient Greeks, Roman, and Persian, and Hindu texts referred to the procedure known as lithotomy for removing bladder stones. Bladder stone was a common ailment plaguing mankind from antiquity to about the 20th century since their diet was beer and barley and sadness. Since the ancient art of lithotomy was first recorded by the Greeks and evolved through five phases before it spread to the rest of the world, the instruments required a knife, a hook, and forceps to remove the stone. The patient would lay on their back, feet apart, and the stone would be pushed to a palpable point of the perineum, which is the piece of skin on a guy in between the party organs in the front and the work organs in the back, and then cutting it 
down. The knives were then wrapped in linens and everything so the incisions wouldn't cut too deeply. Although sometimes fingers were necessary to dig in there and aid in removal. It was an intensely painful procedure with a mortality rate of about 50% as there was no regard for anatomy or dissection and the wounds also were never closed. It's alluded to in the Hippocratic Oath with the line, I will not use the knife even upon those suffering from stones, but I will leave this to those who are trained in this craft. Apparently, everyday blacksmith Jan de Root ain't afraid of no oath. Check out this oil painting he had commissioned of himself after removing his own bladder stone. Really sat there holding it for like 90 hours to commemorate taking a calcified rock out of his own peewee. Look how happy he is. If you've managed to stick through the video to this point, we've got more grizzly coming next. It's the carnivorous cures. Ah, hypocrisy. Ancient Europe's favorite practice aside from not bathing and abject racism. While they were reacting with disgust to and outrage to reports of man eating brought back by travelers to the New World, in this very period, people themselves were using corpse medicine and remedies consisting of human blood, bones, organs, and fat. Corpse medicine is originally found in ancient medical texts from India, China, Mesopotamia, and Greece. It was particularly popular with the Romans and practically every culture around the world resorted to this gruesome range of practice. The Romans believed that the blood of fallen gladiators could cure epilepsy, and 12th century Victorian apothecaries were known for their stock of ground up mummy powder. Meanwhile, in the 17th century England, King Charles II was known for enjoying a draught of King's Drops, a restorative brew made of crumbled human skulls and alcohol. In some cases, the sickly would even attend executions in the hopes of getting a cheap cup of freshly killed person's blood. Why let all that free medicine go to waste in the mud, you know? Their ideology was that by consuming the remains of the deceased person, the patient was also ingesting part of their spirit, leading to the increased vitality and well-being. The types of cures prescribed usually corresponded with the type of ailment. Skull used for migraine, human fat for muscle aches. Despite lots of evidence against it working and overall being gnarly, people felt the cures were efficient and kept up man-eating medicine for centuries. And now, the word scary really hits this treatment right on the nose. Old school rhinoplasty, isn't that a fascinating yet horribly gut-turning sentence? These bad boys were performed in quite a few places and are rumored to either begin in India or ancient Egypt. In Italy, the procedure started to come about due to syphilis, which began afflicting the population in the 16th century. This STI had a horrible symptom called saddle nose, where the bridge of your nose collapses like that of a partying 70s playboy bunny. This nasal deformity was a obvious indicator of indiscretions and so many used surgery to hide it. Gasper Tagliacozzi developed a new method of creating a new nose using tissue from a patient's arm. It's a little confusing, use the picture on screen to see what I'm describing. He would then cover this flap of skin with a piece of skin from the upper arm while it's still attached to the limb. Once the skin graft was firmly attached, after about three weeks, he would separate the skin from the arm. There were reported cases of patients' noses turning purple in the winter and falling off though. Okay, so over in India, they did this crap not even for syphilis, but for ancient human vanity. Found in the Shashrut Samhita, an important medical text from India dated in the 6th century BC, it's the most well-known nose reconstruction contribution to plastic surgery history. Shastra's surgery equipped a leaf to measure the size and shape of the nose, and instead of using the arm, a piece of the skin of the required size should be dissected from the living skin of the cheek and turned back over to cover the nose, keeping a small pedicle attached to the cheek. The part of the nose that which the skin would be attached to should be made raw by cutting at the nasal stump with a knife, and just like that, I'm done. I'm not continuing. It's too gross. Kicking off the list at number 10, medieval manicures. You can clip your toenails anywhere you want these days. An alarming amount of people do it on airplanes, apparently. Yuck. But how do we clip those little piggies back in the day? Before modern fingernail clippers were patented in 1875, we have to look to the ancient Romans and how they got rid of those hangnails. Biting them off, of course. That was the best way. That bad habit I'm sure half of you have, as well as me. That was the best way. Boink. Eating the, eating the nails, bad, bad stuff. In 35 BC, biting nails was written as a way of dealing with nervousness. Even back then, anxiety still had, it was a thing, of course. Ancient Greeks had a tool that looked a lot like toenail clippers, but it was actually used for pulling hairs. I'll get into that one a little bit later. It's a bit more intense. Medieval methods for cutting your nails were usually to use a small knife, so around the Babylonian age, the newly invented scissors would just do the trick as well. You just gotta have really good aim. They're big, rusty, giant, comedically big scissors almost. Sandpaper was also commonly used as well, and to that, I say, great idea. We still use that today. Number nine, hot pokers. Okay, I absolutely hate this so much. It makes me cringe, and it will probably do the same to you. No wonder people are actually afraid of going to the doctors. Their ancestors had good reason to be. It was pretty much comparable to going to a torture clinic. Yeah. 
Though I have to say there was some sense behind this one. If you were to receive an injury where the loss of blood could be fatal, cauterizing the wound was a good way to stop it. But it would definitely suck. They would heat up a hot poker and apply it directly to the wound without the luxury of any painkillers. Obviously, this would be extremely painful. Would I rather bleed out? Or have this done? I honestly don't know. However, it would probably result in infection if not treated properly, especially considering that they didn't wash their damn hands as we found out in the previous video. But they wouldn't just use hot pokers for blood wounds, they would also use them to burn off hemorrhoids and STDs and I don't know, hopes and dreams. It was a bad time. Number 8. Clamshell Hair Removal Whew, Here we go. Nowadays you can laser off any unwanted hair. Waxing as well sounds like an absolute nightmare, but compared to how it used to be done, it's still our best method today. Looking back to around 100,000 years ago, long before Gillette had their 9 blade razors with cooling gels and all that good shit, we had to use seashells. Literal seashells. And when I say seashells, I don't mean they would glide across the skin and you know, Sweeney Todd themselves. No, they would use two shells and then put them together as tweezers and pluck the hairs out one by one. Seashells. Can you hear that? It's the sound of our ancestors plucking their eyebrows. They're still screaming. Sharpened clam shells were used later in the 19th century and we realized if they're flat enough we can swipe them off. So they were sharpening shells. Eventually they got to the gliding technique. Saves time, but still it was horrible. And if that sounds bad, 30,000 years ago we used flint blades to shave. Yeah, just remember when you nick yourself, it can always be better. Number 7. Mouse Skins it honestly seems like we really can't get our eyebrows right. In the early 2000s, they were plucked within an inch of their life. Today, we have brow pencils, waxing, soap brows, which I really don't understand. Back in Elizabethan times, they were plucked entirely off of the face to make foreheads look bigger. And now there's this trend. Eventually, bountiful eyebrows came back into fashion, and for those women who weren't blessed with such brows, resorted to mouse traps. That's right, in order to get that luscious furry frame above their eyes, they would catch mice, skin them, and apply them to their eyes. Yay! In the 17th and 18th century, more specifically, women of nobility were known for shaving off their eyebrows entirely and stick on the mouse skin. It was better if the mice had really dark fur because the popular look of the time was pale skin and black eyebrows. Gee, I wonder where Snow White came from. But even more hilariously, <laughs> they would place their brows higher than normal so they walked around looking surprised all the time. Imagine one of them receiving the worst news possible while simultaneously looking like they just won the lottery. Also, the glue wasn't very good, so they would fall off at leisure. Your mom died. Oh no! Like what the heck? Number 6. Horsehair Dental Floss Yeehaw! Okay, despite how annoying dentists can be sometimes, flossing is vital when it comes to mouth cleanliness. But using horses' hairs to do so, that just sounds counterproductive, no? Early human remains were studied and it showed these grooves in between their teeth. So they would sharpen these little sticks on both sides or use horse hair to get those hard to reach places. Even back then, way in ancient times. If it wasn't horse hair, it was thin long twigs. Honestly, I'd rather use the twigs. At least that has like a scent of some sort. I don't know, like mint, minto green, something like that. Horse back? No. It really wasn't until 1815 until a New Orleans dentist named Levi Spear started to use silk thread to floss in between the teeth instead of hair. Thank you, Levi. As fun as horse hair flossing sounds, I'm gonna stick to the spearmint. Sp spearmint, Levi Spear. Wait a minute. Number five, bloodletting. The practice of bloodletting was common all over the world, but it may have gotten its start in ancient Egypt. It's a quite simple procedure, really. Black bile out of whack? Lose some blood. Can't stop coughing and sneezing? Drain some blood. Been possessed by demons and now they curse and haunt you as they run up and down your bloodstream? Drain some blood. The question is, however, was this really helping? The short answer, no. No, it wasn't. Besides feeling lightheaded and going pale, this didn't really achieve much. Since the days of old were filled with all kinds of other ailments that would easily end someone's life before the spooky demons running up and down someone's bloodstream ever would. I don't feel good. Oh, we better bleed grandpa again. I don't know, like what? Number four, plastic surgery. Hey, there's nothing wrong with a little cosmetic surgery. I for one feel that if it'll make you feel better, go for it. Feel better about yourself, do it. I don't think there's any shame in that. It's been around for a long time, so long that ancient Egyptians might have come up with the first nose jobs. Obviously not like the ones today, but they were knowledgeable in surgeries. After all, 
you open the chest cavity of a dozen kings and you jot some stuff down on some papyrus, you learn a thing or two. More interesting than shaving down your own beak, however, was their implementation of the prosthesis limbs. Yes, all the way back then. One mummy was actually found with a fake toe. When tested in the modern day with period accurate sandals, it proved to work quite well and moved more efficiently than first thought. Again, for the time, this was pretty advanced. Number three, the Ode of the Nile. Imagine people working all day in the blistering sands of Egypt, where the sun beams down on you like well, the sun in the desert, lifting massive rocks and carving them to shape. I don't know about you guys, but I would be sweating. And that also means I wouldn't be smelling too fresh, resembling that of a high school locker room. Yuck. Well, the Egyptians knew this was an issue, so they came up with what was probably the first underarm deodorant. Using nice herbs and other items that had pleasant aromas, and stuck them where the odor was coming from. In ya bits. I just know that after a long day of hard labor in the sun, I would need more than cinnamon sticks and lavender to tame the odor of my sweaty lumberjack armpits. That's just how it goes. Number two, the Egyptian Brazilian. The 70s have come and gone, and a popular trend today is to be hairless everywhere, even in places where you didn't think it was possible to grow hair when you were younger. Egyptians took it upon themselves to remove all their hair. Well, at least most of it. Not because the Nile River had nice beaches, but because of lice. Oh, yuck. While not an exact cure for the itchy bugs that plague schools across America, it did seem to help. And if you've ever had lice before, you know how bad that sucks. I had them once, it was the worst. She cut my hair, shaped, shaved my head. Lots of baths, it's just, it's, it's no fun, man. I'm too cute for that, I don't want that. Number one, Wario breath, wow, okay. It makes sense that Egyptians would come up with breath mints in mouthwash. They fed their laborers diets of foods that contained a lot of onions and garlic. Sure, I'm just like everyone else who cooks, and when the recipe asks for one onion, eh, maybe I put in two. When it asks for two cloves of garlic, maybe I put in four. You gotta love that flavor. It was thought that they helped fight off disease, and. They were kind of right. However, after eating all that flavor, your breath would be something rancid. So herbs and mints were used to help quell the breath that could peel the paint off of walls. Thank God. Kicking off the list at number 10, pig toilets. Yeah, we'll start off with a nasty one. Look, we're on the part six now. We're talking about some ancient hygiene practices. It's gonna get gross, it just has to at this point. I've talked about Roman toilets, horsehair dental floss. So now we gotta dive into some yucky stuff. Pig toilets began around 200 BC in China and these pig toilets were actually pretty common. You would just go to the washroom over top of a pig pen. It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty awful, but also it's all they had. It's pretty awful, but I would say it's worse for the pigs. Definitely worse for the pigs. The pigs would eat the waste because it was mixed into their food. They couldn't tell the difference. Ugh, horrible. This was one of the few options to manage waste, especially in areas where plumbing wasn't possible. I talked about pigs going to court in your recent Bumblebee video. If I was a pig, I would be pressing charges left, right, and center after this. That's so disgusting. We're at number 10 and I wanna puke. Nice, buckle up. Number nine, water closets. This one sounds fun, a closet full of water. What a blast, pun intended. Back in the 1800s, all over Europe, our modern day version of the bathroom came to life. Thankfully, I'm, I'm very glad this happened. If it didn't happen, it'd be, it'd be a little bit different nowadays. It takes two things to have a water closet, a home big enough for a room purely devoted to waste, which is amazing, and of course, running water, that definitely helps. Sir John Harrington, godson to Queen Elizabeth I, was determined to invent what we now know as the basic toilet. Back in 1596, he created this idea, and people actually made fun of this guy for spending so much time working on a useless device. Yeah. The more we know. Cut to 200 years later, another inventor by the name of Alexander Cummings reworked the water closet, added an S trap, the little valve between the top and the bottom parts of the bowl, and now we're on the right track. Then a couple years later, in 1777, Samuel Prosser applied for a plunger closet patent and got it. A year later after that, Joseph Brama enters the toilet game, adds a valve on the bottom, an old school ball cock. So we're getting there, slowly over time. Different inventors are bringing their new ideas in, all so that we can go and take a Brahman was a sailor at the time, so his water closet was often used on ships of that era. Today we have toilets that flush automatically. Once you get up or move around, the sensors think you're done, and then they blast away. If you stand and wipe, good game. This thing's gonna be making noise all day long. Number eight, 
bald face. In another video on things too woke for this era, I talked about how it was once cool to have no hair on your face at all. I can't grow any facial hair, so this is this reaches out to me. This is good. I like this. I like punching out on this fact. Well, Queen Elizabeth I was the first to bring this idea into Western culture. She influenced women to completely pluck their eyebrows, and on top of that, they would also shave their hairline back as far as they could, so their faces would be as large and as big and bright as possible. Just right there, like the big moon, just hmm. It was common for women to soak bandages in a mix of ammonia, vinegar, walnut oil, all to hopefully, hopefully suppress the hair growth on their forehead. Facial hair was removed, but body hair, that was left untouched. The Catholic Church also influenced the look. Growing your hair out was a feminine display until you went out in public and had long hair, then it was immodest. Because, of course, number seven, loincloths. Okay, I have to adjust the jeans for this one. Going back to ancient Roman and ancient Egyptian times, the loincloth was used by all. Neat. Either that or you would just be naked. So, you know, if you're a nudist, great. Hit the thumbs up if you're a nudist. I don't know. I don't know why I said that. We're gonna keep going. I found this neat step-by-step -step on the internet how to make your own loincloth. And it's a bit more complicated than throwing on sweatshorts and calling it a day. We don't have a lot of archeological evidence today because these linens barely made it through a decade, let alone all this time. But ancient Romans would use leather also to make underwear, which is, just imagine that, I'm like, ha, ah, it's hot. Hot goat skin wrapped around your waist in the sun. We love it. We still use leather today when it comes to undergarments, but we'll save that talk for another time. Number six, breast bags. There's a neat term, breast bags. Let's bring that one back, see if it sticks. Now, contrary to what I just explained over at point number seven, women, more often than not, didn't wear undergarments in the Middle Ages. Up here, at least. But in 2008, at Austria's Langburn Castle, something that resembled a modern day bra was discovered. It's believed that only higher ups, ladies of nobility rather, were the only ones who had the privilege to wear these breast bags or breast cups. I say breast bags, sounds a little funnier. We have bags of milk in Canada, so you know, I'm connecting the, yeah, that's, that's, I gotta connect the jokes. I can't say much personally, but this does not look supportive enough at all. It's like a pirate flag, it's like ripped apart, this is nothing. If you have back problems, I don't think these breast bags are gonna help you. If you're ever catching up on some 13th century readings, well, now you have an image when you see the word breast bag. This, this eye patch that they called support. At number five, kidney stones. Now I can't say that I'm all that familiar with the way that kidney stones are treated these days, but I would assume that it is very different and not as terrifying as how they were treated back in the medieval age. After learning about this, I'm convinced that this could double as a form of torture. Basically how it went down is a physician's assistant would be sitting on top of you while you had your legs strapped to your neck. And then as the assistant was holding you, the doctor would stick two of his fingies up your little booty hole, press his fist against your pubes until he felt a hard pellet indicating a stone. After the diagnosis, then it would be removed through the bladder using a sharp instrument. Now I've never had a kidney stone, so I don't know how painful it is to have one, but for those who have experienced this, would you rather go through this medieval procedure or just tough it out until you pass the stone yourself? At number four, butt stuff. Even back in the medieval age, they had treatments for hemorrhoids. This illness was often associated with St. Fiaker, also referred to as the quote, patron of hemorrhoids. A 7th century tale said that this monk cured his illness by sitting on a sacred rock for several hours, and so in the medieval age, some physicians believed that the same method could apply to other people's butts. Obviously, that didn't work, so some other superstitious physicians came up with an alternate and more nightmare-inducing way of getting rid of hemorrhoids. If you didn't want to sit on a sacred rock for an extended period of time, you could always get a red-hot iron tube put up your butt. Yeah, I don't think it gets any worse than that. At number three, belladonna. Belladonna, deadly nightshade, whatever you want to call it, doesn't make it any less poisonous. This plant is one of the most toxic plants around, but that doesn't mean that people haven't tried to use it in their personal use. Normally, we want to stay away from toxic things like chemicals and X's, but back in the days of old, people said full scent and used belladonna as eye drops. Yeah, that's right. Even though this is literally poisonous, they thought, hmm, let's put it in our eyeballs. The organs that we use to see, because that's a bright idea, right? Many people, mostly women, used eye drops made out of deadly nightshade because it changed the size of their pupils to make them look more starry-eyed, and that was seen as a beauty trend. In moderation, these eye drops wouldn't really cause too much damage, but prolonged use of the poison could see some serious health concerns like stiff muscles, short-term memory loss, confusion, disorientation, and in some cases, death, because it could literally paralyze your heart. And if you're thinking, man, I'm so glad we don't do that anymore, then think again, baby, because if you've ever been to the optometrist and you've had your pupils dilated, guess what they use? That's right, 
belladonna. It's not harmful to put just a couple drops in your eyes and not to do it again for a while, but if you get your hands on it and start using it too much and in high dosage, then you're in for some trouble. At number two, trepanation. Trepanation is the process of drilling or scraping a hole into the human skull. Yeah, I know, that doesn't really sound like fun in the slightest, but back in the olden days, people did it. And it was a relatively common body modification for some reason. This practice was done in all sorts of cultures throughout different periods of time. During the medieval ages into the Renaissance, trepanation was used to treat epilepsy and mental disorders. This practice also dates as far back as the Paleolithic period. In ancient Peru, trepanation was done using a ceremonial knife called a tumi. In ancient Greece, it was done using a drill. Polynesians used sharpened seashells and in Europe, the procedure was done using sharp flint or obsidian. Though we know that in the medieval times and the Renaissance, trepanation was considered a medical practice, in ancient times, the reason for this practice is still uncertain. It could have been to try and fix damage from a head trauma, but it's also believed that this practice was done to heal mental problems, release toxic spirits, or even as some kind of ritual. And finally, at number one, knife hand. Now this one is by far the craziest medieval surgery in my opinion. So you know Captain Hook, right? Just got a hook for a hand. Well, this guy I'm gonna tell you about has Captain Hook beat by a landslide. A 6th century medieval burial was found in Italy and it revealed a male warrior who had a knife for a hand. Yeah, this man had a knife instead of a hand. This warrior had his hand amputated, however the reason for said amputation is unknown. In place of the lost hand, the prosthesis was a blade. Now I don't know if this guy lost his hand in battle or something and they just gave him the best that they could, and that was a knife as a placeholder, or if he just willingly chopped off his hand so that he could have a knife hand. But either way, that is so badass and I would have loved to see this guy in battle. Number 10, chloroform for asthma. Yeah, chloroform, like the... See ya, that kind of stuff. In the past, chloroform was occasionally used as a treatment for asthma, believe it or not, albeit with limited understandings of its potential risks and side effects, of course, as are all of these. The rationale behind this practice stemmed from the belief that asthma was caused by excessive bronchial spasm or nervous irritability. Now, it was thought that chloroform at the time, with its sedative and calming properties, calming properties, could relax the bronchial muscles and alleviate the symptoms of asthma attacks. On paper, sure, sounds may be doable. Scientifically, we're like, no, never, don't do that at all, please God. Chloroform, a volatile liquid with anesthetic properties, was administered through inhalation. Patients would inhale the vapor, which was believed to have a soothing effect on the respiratory system, sure, providing temporary relief from the constriction and wheezing associated with asthma. Chloroform is a potent and toxic substance, known to depress the central nervous system and cause respiratory depression when administered in excessive amounts. Oh, additionally, it carries the risk of a addiction and long-term health complications. So no, not a great start on this list today. Number nine, flowers for cataracts. In traditional medicine, periwinkle flowers were sometimes used as a treatment for cataracts. Cataracts, a condition characterized by the clouding of lens in the eye, shout out to my brother Kyle, he's blind as sh Periwinkle flowers contain alkaloids such as vincamine and vincristine, which are known to have pharmacological effects on the circulatory system. I sound like Bill Nye. It was believed that these compounds could enhance blood circulation to the eyes, potentially improving vision and slowing down the progress of these cataracts. People would prepare infusions or extracts from the flowers and then apply them topically or consume them orally in the hopes, again, mostly hopes here, that their vision problems would go away or something would alleviate. However, it's important to note that the efficiency of periwinkle flowers in treating cataracts has not been scientifically proven at all. Eating flowers is not going to help your eye. Of course not. You know what I mean? Cataracts are a complex condition with various underlying causes, and their treatment typically requires surgery or corrective lenses. Not a couple flower petals. That's not, what is this? No, definitely not. Number eight, sour cream hands. Nice, that was my nickname back in elementary. In the past, old sour cream was occasionally used as a home remedy to alleviate chapped hands. Nice, let's do it. Taco Tuesdays, let's do it. The rationale behind this practice was that the lactic acid present in sour cream could, maybe, potentially, not really, help exfoliate dead skin cells and moisturize the hands. Sounds gross, but it kind of worked sometimes. The creamy consistency of sour cream was believed to create a protective barrier, preventing further moisture loss and promoting healing. However, before you go in and ruin your taco night at home, it's important to note that this remedy lacks any scientific evidence and may not provide long-lasting or optimal results. Yeah, sour cream, just keep that on your, keep that on your wrap, not your hands. 
then you're all set. Number seven, Nux vomica. In history, Nux vomica derived from the seeds of Strychnos Nux vomica tree, very poisonous. It was an occasionally used as a remedy for headaches. Not a good plan. This practice was based on the belief that the seeds contained compounds that could alleviate pain. Sure, again, good attempt, bad landing. Nux vomica was thought to have stimulant properties, increasing blood flow, relieving tension, all that good stuff, which in turn could provide relief from headaches. However, it's important to note that the seeds contain strychnine, which is a highly toxic substance, one of the worst of the worst for humans to eat, and their use as a remedy is not supported by the modern medical knowledge at all. Safer and more effective treatments for headaches are now available. You don't have to be eating any poisonous nuts. Thank you so much. Number six, urine. In ancient history, urine, P, number one, it was sometimes used as a medical treatment due to the belief that it possessed healing properties. Yeah, pour it in your eyes, see what happens. Don't do this. The practice can be attributed to various factors, including cultural beliefs, limited medical knowledge, of course, and the symbolic association of urine with bodily fluids and purification. Yeah, that last one's a big one. One reason urine was used as a treatment with this historical connection to the concept of uroscopy. That's where the color and smell and taste of urine was examined to diagnose illnesses. Yeah, some dude would be like, Bronchitis, that man's got bronchitis, go get him. This practice originated from the belief that urine was a reflection of the body's overall health and imbalances. In some way, sure, in most ways, no. Furthermore, urine was considered to have cleansing properties and was believed to contain a substance that could combat infection and promote healing. Mm, that good healing stuff, there we go. Brewing up that healing potion. It was used topically to clean wounds, it was used as eye drops to treat eye infections, and it was even consumed orally for various ailments. However, it is crucial to note that the use of urine as a medical treatment in ancient times, or any of those times, was not based on scientific understanding or evidence whatsoever. They were just putting pee in their eyes and just hoping for the best. Number five, urine deep. Turns out we used pee for a lot of things back in the day, and today we still do? Question mark? The Romans used urine to wash their clothes, and even more impressive slash gross is the fact that they used urine to help with inflammation, burns, or skin disease. Yeah, pee was the number one trick. Get it, number one? I, okay, we'll move on. Best way to whiten that smile was not a crest white strip, but rather a facial mask dip, dipped, dipped in the mellow yellow. Just pee. This is so gross. We mentioned on this channel before that gladiator sweat was once bottled and then sold. Well, their pee as well was sold as this beauty product. Clean out those pores with a drop of Igor. Mm. Get it while it's hot, folks. This is extremely gross, obviously, but it does make sense. The ammonia in urine kicks stains away for good. That's why they would wash their clothes in the same way. Now we get it. History. Gross. Uh, number four, rush plants. Today we use chic shag carpets that, you know, really tie the room together. Sips white Russian. But back in the olden times, they used something called the rush plant to pad their floors. But the thing was, this layer of dense plant material was a breeding ground for nits, ticks, and other creepy crawlies. It was it was a really unsanitary situation, but well, like what else were you supposed to do? However, this kind of flooring made them vulnerable to disease and infection. The reason being, as these floors would not be renewed for sometimes 20 years, the bottom layer, left undisturbed, would accumulate a lot of really gross stuff like uh, animal droppings, feces, the piece of grizzle you dropped that one time, fish craps, whatever. So um, it was just not, it was like a, basically a swamp down there. Number three, royal bum. The groom of the stool is a little bit different than the groom of a wedding. It was perhaps one of the worst jobs to have, but, but, pun intended, it's one of the most important roles. The groom of the king's close stool was a position created during King Henry VIII's reign. Their job was to wipe the king's butt. And if that doesn't sound horrible enough, this poor lad would carry the king's stool with him, like on his back, like a Jansport, and then monitor the king's mealtimes, and they would plan their day around when they thought the king would take a sh I would be so anxious if a guy wearing a box toilet was just hanging out near me. He's like, hey, you feeling all right, boss? You good? You feeling full? That was a lot of bread earlier. You sure? All right, take five. Just, I don't know. Just take a look. I don't know. I'll let you be. Just jump. You must be thinking, what poor soul got stuck with this job? Well, this job was an honor, my friend. Sons of noblemen were awarded this role. You would get pretty close to the king, I mean, obviously, but as time went on, these grooms became secretaries to that king. Pretty good upgrade. Eventually, getting a higher pay and benefits. Yeah, I would hope so. Even the king's walking, talking toilet gets dental back in the day. How neat is that? Number two, eagle dung. I'm honestly not even sure what to say about this. 
you know? You have to have some kind of magnificent conviction to be like, I have no reason to believe this is true, but I am 110% sure that bird dung will fix it. Like that's some kind of confidence I don't think I'm ever gonna get. Eagle dung was a common substance found in the birthing room of all places. It was often rubbed in to alleviate the pain, most often accompanied by rose water because who wants to smell that while well, they're bringing life to the world? No one, obviously. Obviously that didn't work and the bacteria from the stuff probably didn't help their recovery either. They also used to place amulets and charms on the stomach to speed contractions and put coriander on the thighs. Coriander was believed to attract the baby out of the womb. A risky move considering people either love or hate coriander. There's no in between. It either tastes like soap or it's the best thing you've ever had. If the delivery was proving difficult, they would open covered doors, untie hair and perform other metaphors to help the mother deliver easier. But it's the eagle dung that really gets me here, folks. I, I, have, no, I have no excuse for them. Number one, the dirty dead. What feels like a never-ending maze, the catacombs under Paris stretch for hundreds of miles. They're a big tourist attraction, obviously, today. Horror movies have been made about these catacombs, just these walls of skulls. But where did they come from? Why were they put there? Also, how bad was that smell? See, originally the tunnels were built for Paris stone mines, but near the end of the 18th century, its purpose started to shift. Cemeteries were starting to pile up, and I mean that in a literal sense, disgusting. There was nowhere to put all these bodies, and everybody else started to get sick because of them, because they were breathing in, you know, dad corpse hot dog breath. They didn't quite know how to handle the dead in a clean way, so they just wanted these bodies out of sight and out of mind. So all these dead bodies that were laying in alleys or on the side of the road, they were gathered and then tossed under the city in these tunnels. These tunnels have been there for centuries before them, so you might as well put them to good use. And by good use, I mean let's just stack skulls in an orderly fashion and terrorize civilians for centuries to come. Beautiful. About all things hairy and how the French royalty all aspired to cosplay Rapunzel. A tale originating from 6th century Paris, France is about two princes who were going to ascend to the throne. They were kidnapped and the queen consort was given the choice, allow her grandson's hair to be cut or let them die with their luscious locks intact. She chose the sword over the scissors. One of the princes does manage to escape and he cuts his own hair and becomes a monk. In modern times saying alright kill him instead of a haircut does sound crazy, but back then and men who had long hair showed their power and wealth. According to the Byzantine poet historian Agathias, it is the rule for Frankish kings to never be shorn. Indeed, their hair is never cut from childhood on and hangs in abundance on their shoulders. Their subjects have their hair cut round and are not permitted to grow it further. In Germany, men also typically wore their hair long, but they would tie it up in a bun or on the top of their head and sometimes hide it under a fancy hat. In general, dark ages were a time where women did rarely cut their hair and there wasn't really any time period where short hair for women was trendy then. Lower class women typically wore their hair up in braids and buns because it was easier for them to work with while upper class women got to style their hair with more intricate processes using ribbons and metallic wires to help keep their braids and buns in place like a Leia. On the other end of the spectrum however, bold is punishment. To address why the grandmother would allow her grandson's death before a haircut, in today's world men shave their heads for all sorts of reasons. They could be naturally losing their hairline, have alopecia, or they're just prone to hair loss. However, in medieval times, hair was considered a symbol of power for royal men, as explained. Royal men never cut their hair, so the longer the locks, more powerful you're supposed to be. So as a man, if you let go of your hair, this was a huge sign of humility. If the grandsons from the first story had returned with shorn hair but are meant to be the throne's heirs, they would make the throne look weak and susceptible. Only monks would shave their heads, leaving a narrow strip of hair horizontally horizontally around. Other times, only in the middle of a man's head was shaved and the rest was left alone. And of course, as you may know well from our other Dark Age videos, head shaving for women during this time was a degrading punishment, as a woman's long hair was meant to be her most seductive feature. We talked about one type of head hair, let's travel down to the other, bearded baddies. Recently, beards have made a huge comeback, especially now among the young generations thanks to throwback fashion. Studies have shown that people also associate a man with a beard as being more intelligent and many people find them to be incredibly attractive. Also nothing is cooler than the giant dude with the bald head and like the big ass beard, you know, let's be real. Respect for beards though is nothing new. During medieval times knights were known to grow their beards as a sign of honor and if one man touched another man's sign of honor, well it was enough of an insult to challenge them to a duel to the death. Now shaving was common during the middle ages, commoners would be clean shaven for the most part. Royalty was also usually shaven or had a very trim beard that was kept neat and tidy. 
Hilariously, however, this is kind of how barbers get started. Back in medieval times, mirrors were very small and cloudy, so they're not reliable. They were also only available to the upper class. On top of that, razors as we know them today didn't exist, so if you want to shave, you need to use one of those dangerously long razor blades. So most folks would visit the local barber surgeon for a Sweeney Todd style lineup. As we mentioned earlier, monks had shaved heads and no beards, so they took turns shaving one another as a community. And speaking of faces, the Dark Ages were surprisingly skincare obsessed. Vikings are remembered as some of the most hygienic of historical people, and they were reported to have the best practices of personal hygiene in the early Middle Ages especially. Most notable was the near daily bathing they did in the cold waters of fjords and rivers. They used combs made out of ivory or innate wood carvings, and they practiced braiding their hair for prestige and ranking. The daily practice of bathing and personal hygiene actually was what spared the king of Poland from an outbreak of plagues that had been seen in Europe. Meanwhile, in England, bathing was not as common as it is today and it was often reserved for special occasions. People would usually wash their hands and faces regularly, however. The ideal woman in the Middle Ages had that pale, smooth skin without any pockmarks or blemishes. Nearly everyone washed their face with cold water at the end of the day, even if they wouldn't wash the rest of themselves for inexplicable amounts of time. Some women used ointments made of animal fat in order to keep skin soft and smooth. And crystal girlies, even back then, people believed in the power of gemstones to heal. Women would lick amethyst and rub it over their pimples to make it go away. But rest assured, when it's bath time, you were naked in a crowd. In many Middle Age cultures, public bathing was commonplace. The Romans, Egyptians, Greeks, they were especially known for their bathhouses. And in the spring and summer, commoners could be spotted using streams and rivers to take a bath on a nice warm day. Back then, this wasn't seen as being indecent or strange. Water was scarce, and the process of heating a bath was time consuming and expensive. So, it was also common to share bath water among a lot of people and be less wasteful. However, people are still humans after all, so, like teens at a pool party, public bathing became associated with a certain level of sensuality. Seeing as this was a time period where intercourse was usually in hearing or seeing range of your imminent direct family, it's not a surprise this happened, let alone the fact nobody actually cared if it was. Well, except the church. They threw a bunch of laws around to try and limit that crap, but that's always what they've done. Anywho, in Japan, they still continue the tradition of public bathing in hot springs to this day. However, they have the option to segregate when men from women, so it's not as often that people leave the public bathhouse to hook up nowadays. Not to get you guys too excited either, but... Number five, medical shows. Today, medical shows, they're fascinating. Dr. Pimple Popper, I'll watch that all day while I eat. I don't even care, I'm disgusting like that. Dude's getting mashed potatoes squeezed out of their back, so I'm like, ah, let's go, I love it. I'm slapping that thumbs up, it's my shit. Back in the Wild West, the 1860s, the 1890s, you know, they had what's called medicinal showmen. These are, what an absolute joke, what a con. These guys would go town to town selling elixirs and tonics, everything one needs to live a happy and comfortable Western life, but they were full of lies. None of this shit is true. These professional medicinal showmen would have pawns run ahead and plant themselves in the audience before these random demonstrations of amazing medical elixirs, right? These shows, a bunch of bullshit. They would call up random audience members, that guy that ran ahead, and then use one of these elixirs and magically treat their ailment on the spot in front of the public, right? Almost as if it was a magic show. One of the most successful of these elixirs was the elixir made from John Healy and Charles Bigelow. It was a mixture of herbs, roots, and animal fat, said to treat any and all illness. But in reality, it was just an extremely strong laxative. So yeah, if you're gonna take it, make sure you're close to home. Yeah. Number four, bad bartenders. When we think of old saloons, old west saloons with the swinging doors and stuff, a few catchphrases and a cowboy with some whiskey, all that good stuff, the bartender back then would pour a drink, the cowboy would take the bottle instead. So illegal, sir, that's that, please put that back. Back in the wild, wild western days, grabbing a drink at the bar wasn't like that at all. It wasn't like anything you see in the movies. It sucked. Bartenders, they had no regulations to follow behind that dirty bar. But not only was it very high proof, but some bevy like tarantula juice was just, it would just poison you. It was literal poison. If its name didn't tip you off, it was literally made with poisonous ingredients. Cause that was, that's how cowboys did it back then. But they're hairs. I don't know. Tarantula juice was made from strychnine. If you drink it, you're gonna feel like there's tarantulas crawling all over your skin. 
That was their pitch back then. They're like, eh, happy hour, come get tarantula juice. I'm like, awesome, thank you so much. How do I not tip? Which button do I press to not give you money, you freak? Number three, grow it out. In the old west era of the United States, men often grew their hair long as a practical choice rather than a cool fashion statement. You know what I mean? All those bandits with their long hair, they had to. Living in the rugged and often isolated terrain of the west, men had to perform many physically demanding tasks like hunting, ranching, mining, pouring whiskey drinks and tarantula juice. Long hair would help protect their scalp and neck from the sun and wind and all that good stuff. But it's important to note that haircuts were not always easily accessible back then. And many men back then could not afford them or did not have access to a barber. It's like, I can't cut it. He's like, where? We don't have anything. We don't have dental. What do we do? As a result, growing their hair long became a practical and functional choice for many men back in the old west rather than, you know, style. And they were going for looks back then. They weren't doing man buns, doing the cowboy thing. They're like, no, I have bugs. I don't want you to see my bugs. I'm gonna grow it, thanks. Number two, outhouses. This one here stinks. In the wild west, outhouses were sadly common as indoor plumbing was not yet available. They didn't think of that yet. So these structures were often simple and consisted of a small building, if you wanna call it that, with a hole in the ground for your Huh, your waste disposal, if you wanna call it that. Now, due to the unsanitary conditions and lack of proper waste management and knowledge and you know knowledge about germs and stuff, outhouses could attract a variety of insects and other pests, and it was just bad to go in there. Flies, mosquitoes, other bugs, they were commonly found in and around these structures, and they could potentially transmit diseases to humans. So, if you're in there, you really get your business done and then get out. You don't want to waste time. You're not checking any tweets while you're in there, that's for sure. Despite the unsanitary conditions of an outhouse, they were a necessary part of daily life in the Wild West. And people learned to tolerate the bugs and just deal with it. Because they're like, you know what? This is better than going on outside. Whatever's going on out there, we're good. Close that up. One time I went to a cottage when I was younger and my mom didn't tell me that they had only an outhouse. No running water the entire week. I was like, awesome, let's turn around, I guess. I'm not doing that. I held it for like seven days straight. It was a nightmare. And finally, number one, broken bones. I'm lucky enough to have never broken a bone. I mean, knock on all the woods. But what if you did back in the old Western days, right? Then what would happen? But is a cowboy gonna heal you up? No. What if you were trying to learn a kickflip and you broke your leg? Then what? What are you gonna do? If the dental plan was any indication, it's... It's not pretty, not a lot of options. In the Old West, broken bones were a common occurrence, particularly among those who worked in physically demanding jobs, like ranchers, miners, cowboys, around livestock, those things kicking you randomly, something's gonna break. Treatment options were limited and often relied on first aid techniques, you know, splinting the affected area with whatever materials were available, such as wood, cloth, or even animal hides. It sounds crazy, but back then, that was really the only method for immobilizing broken bones. Pain relief, that was only provided with natural remedies, such as oak or willow bark tea, so. You're gonna feel that entire healing process. It's gonna suck. More serious fractures, like ones that, you know, go through the skin, those require the attention of a doctor or a surgeon. However, you know, those medical professionals back then were not always available in the remote areas of the Wild West. No helicopter's gonna come in and grab you and then take you out. No, it's, you're basically fucked more often than not. Number five, the great stink. Um, the what, what? Oh, no, 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 yeah, I read that right. The Great Stink of 1858 was an event in central London in the summer, during which the hot weather exaggerated and amplified the smell of untreated human waste and gunk that had washed up on both in and on the banks of the River Thames. The problem had been growing for years with an out-of-date technology and overflowing sewage system that emptied directly into the river. The stank was thought to have been the root cause of a number of contagious diseases and three outbreaks of cholera before it was agreed upon that a small problem was emerging. You think? Long story short, all the garbage, human waste, bloated bodies were all just washing up around the same time. Hey, I caught one. No, oh, that's an arm. Okay. And just cooking in all that sun all day? I know what August feels like, and I've smelt my garage and garbage day, and I can't imagine the smell already in central London at that time. And for people to have complained so much that it was even stinkier, that's absolutely rotten. Number four, nose gaze. I was just thinking, where are all these inventions and blueprints on how to stop the smell? If you can knit metal into a crop top, you can cover your mouth and nose, can't you? Well, close enough. Nose gays were invented. Basically just big nose plugs one would wear day to day to drown out the smell of absolute filth. 
Just plug it up and ignore it was their mentality. A makeshift wad of bunched up herbs and flowers shoved up your nose, blocking the nasal cavity from the stank that followed. Just C number five. A poo-pourri for each nostril. Would this make things worse, ignoring the smell? Wouldn't that make it even harder to find out where it's coming from? Nope, just band-aid it. It's gonna disappear on its own. We're humans, we're designed to smell stuff for our own survival. The smell is like what lets us know not to go down there. Oh, no, no. Like, wouldn't everything just smell like roses at that point? These people were trying to avoid the stinky streets because that actually meant that's where the infection and disease was actually hanging out. The blind leading the blind. Number three, flushing. Okay, we're making some ground here. We got toilet paper, we got something for the smell. So now where do we put it? Well, plumbing and flushing wasn't connected to each house like it is today. See, the Greeks and Romans had it down to a science. They built drainage systems and learned from the ancient Mesopotamian people how to exactly deal with the problem of waste. A system of pipes, tubes, and drains. The bathroom problem seemed like an easy solution. Use gravity downhill to dispose of the waste outside the city. And here's the kicker. It can even be reused and repurposed at the end as an irrigation system, further nurturing the farming of crops. No, that's good. No, he's right. And then it disappears and literally goes downhill again. After the Roman Empire had fallen, this European dark sanitation era had begun and hygiene sort of just slipped away. People weren't really concerned with things like disease and plague and instead leaned into real science like witchcraft or burning cats for fun. You know, important stuff. It wasn't until about the mid 1850s where people revisited this age old problem and recreated and did exactly the same thing science we already knew. Things were unnecessarily stinky for way too long. It wasn't until the British colony started tinkering in Boston around the 1700s that proper piping and toiletry transport was eventually built and catalogued. Thus was born the first sanitation system, again. And we still see it today, thank God. Number two, disinfectants. How did people exactly know if something was clean or not? They couldn't have just seen the particles back then. Let's hear a chamber pot. Smells clean. People were plugging their noses so they couldn't even smell anything. They couldn't smell if it was clean or not. There certainly wasn't a demand for a fresh lemon scent that we're all used to. This was the birth of some basic antiseptic. Chemists were mixing and matching chemicals and a new form of cleaning agent was introduced in the 1890s by German chemist science Gustav Ruppenstrock in hopes to rid the country of the overflowing cholera epidemic and seize the spread of germs and the disease. By mixing benzalkonium and hydrogen peroxide, you were left with a chemical compound that would destroy and clean infections on medical patients. Light bulb. Thus leaning towards the direction of an all-purpose surface cleaner, killing bacteria and ridding the area of harmful toxins. And drum roll please, Lysol was created. That's right, the same Lysol we use today. This was a push in the right way for humanity. An easy to use liquid cleaner that would aid disinfecting everything in its way. I've seen the bottle and the Wemyss labels. Must have been even stronger back then too. Hope no one spilled it on themselves in testing. Ooh, ouch, that is a class one chemical burn. <laughs> You're just gonna wanna pee on that for 12 to 13 days. And number one, soap. Finally, the end of all our ailments. Soap, the answer. Well, not really. See, it's been around since the Romans because they literally did everything before us and stop bragging, we get it. Made out of animal fats, ash, and mostly lye, these makeshift balls of soap were invented years ago. And then forgotten, and then invented again, and then forgotten again. Cleanliness was loose, remember, and it was almost uncool to believe in science, and it wasn't really until the mass production of this chemical detergent that it really stuck. Soap was predominantly sold produced and commercialized in the late 1800s. By this time, scientists were fiddling around with things like Lysol and more chemical compounds, sparking its way to the study of germs, a vital step towards large-scale soap production. And it actually started in 1791, when a French chemist, Nicolas Leblanc, patented a system for making soda ash from salt, at which point added with animal fat, and there you have it. The slippery bar we're all used to today. The discovery made soap making one of America's fastest growing industries in 1850. And it seemed from then on in it was only up. It's crazy to think that someone at this time, even after soap was invented, were still spit shining surgical instruments to be clean. That's good. Well, there you have it folks. I'm absolutely disgusted and yet carry a now cleaner representation of who we are and what we've done. From stink houses to spas, hygiene has come a long way. Or 
maybe not. Watch out, it may shock ya. Number five is shock treatment. When profit can be made off of insecurity, unsavory business flourishes. Victorians honed in on the man's moral weaknesses as a cause for erectile dysfunction, and impotence was thought to be caused by either too much sex and masturbation or not enough. So doctors took a few shocking routes, literally, such as galvantic baths or bathtubs filled with electrodes, which were supposed to restore sexual desire in an advertised six sessions. For a more direct approach, a thin rod with running electric current could be placed up into a man's ear. Repeat that twice a week, about five minutes each time, and your little man should be ready to rumble. By the late 1800s, ads were running for electric belts aimed at weak men. They claimed to help cure kidney pain and sciatic nerve issues and back aches and headaches and nervous exhaustion, and of course, mainly their dysfunction. While today impotence is recognized as the result of physical or mental duress, age, or genetics, the belief that electric shock therapy is a useful cure for impotence still persists, and some studies have shown positive signs. See that, fellas? Don't knock it till you try it. Speaking of electrocuting genitals, you can't tell me that didn't happen at least once with the first electric vibrators, which is number 4 in our countdown. Female hysteria became a diagnosable medical condition way back in medieval times when the concept of a wandering uterus, when a discontented or displaced uterus would cause a woman ill health, was first coined. Believed to have symptoms such as irritability, insomnia, fainting, anxiety, menstruation, or horniness, pretty much every woman showed these symptoms. Hysteria was pretty common. Doctors cure hysterical paroxysm and orgasm. For hundreds of years leading up to this invention, doctors were manually administering pelvic massages to women to achieve the necessary cure. But all that wrist work added up over time and doctors needed a break. So cue Dr. Joseph Mortimer Granville, he created an electric steam powered electromechanical medical instrument, nicknamed the manipulator. The device allowed women to give themselves home massages to cure their wandering wounds and giving doctors the well deserved break they needed. A questionable cure for a very questionable diagnosis. Number three is not for the faint of heart. They loved leeches. It may be crazy to imagine, but between the late 1700s and well into the early 1900s, there was a booming leech trade all across Europe. Leeches were shipped from Germany to America by the tens of thousands. England even had to start importing them from France by the mid 1800s as their own leech stocks were not even enough to supply their own doctors. Francis Bersuyas believed that all diseases resulted from the excess buildup of blood and documented this belief in a medical journal that would subsequently caused leeches to become the go-to treatment in France and then later spread across Europe. This usage of leeches then became worldwide from there, and so obscene that the creatures started to go extinct. However, what these quacks didn't know is that bloodletting was very, very, very rarely beneficial to any conditions, and applying leeches often resulted in detrimental side effects such as blood loss, diarrhea, and vomiting, or those with poor immune systems could even be exposed to hazardous bacteria and infection. Let alone death from hemorrhagic shock for literally anyone they did this to. Eventually, the excessive use of leeches meant that they became too expensive to ship, too scarce due to the over farming to find, and medically obsolete in the face of new science that questioned the medical merits of bloodletting. Thank God. Number two doesn't allow you to touch where number one usually comes out. It's the masturbatory mental illness. Obviously, it's natural, normal, and well, fun, but the Victorian perspective of masturbation was nowhere near what it is today. As our old timely friends saw it as a serious threat to mental and physical health or even could kill you. Self love was seen as an ultimate evil, but beyond moralistic arguments, many physicians thought that every orgasm drained a man's energy. Married men were warned by doctors to limit the amount of sex they were having, while unmarried men were encouraged and urged to conserve their essence by avoiding sex altogether, particularly masturbation. Even wet dreams and uncontrolled ejaculation were considered a sexual dysfunction as masturbation essentially became the male version of hysteria. So how did you treat this condition? Men had to stop masturbating. Fear and shame campaigns did what they do best and stimulated the market to provide quick quack remedies. They came in the form of anti-masturbation devices that looked like torture chambers. Most popular was the jugum, which was a metal ring attached around the base of a man's, you know, and then screwed on. If he was to become erect at any point, whether awake or asleep, the now inflated skin would make contact with sharp metal teeth that would dig in. Like I said, most popular. Consider how much worse these other options were for that to be the primo choice. A spermatic truss was essentially the first jock strap, but meant for every day. And the Bowden device fastened a little metal helmet to the end of a man's member that bound up into his 
with pubic hair so that it would be ripped out should he become erect. I'm more than happy to keep going, but I'm sure more than enough people are wincing right now. Keep in mind, while these men were going through this to avoid masturbation, women were being prescribed it as a cure. Number one on our countdown may be a bit of a surprise, surgery. How could surgery be a questionable treatment? Well, it itself isn't, but the men performing it and their hygiene towards surgery were. Most famous is Robert Liston, said to be able to remove a leg in 30 seconds, he notoriously used his own mouth to hold scalpels, knives, and even once sucked the pus out of a woman's throat wound. According to medical historian Dr. Lindsay Fitzharris, surgeons never washed their instruments or their hands, and Victorian surgeons were known for wearing old surgery garments out of prowess, reportedly so stiff with old blood that they were nearly cardboard in appearance. Even the operating tables themselves were rarely washed down, and it was said a visitor to St. George's Hospital in London 1825 discovered mushrooms and maggots thriving in the damp, dirty sheets of a patient's bed. When asked why they hadn't complained, the patient assumed this to be the norm. And what about surgery in the moment? Well, the patients were conscious and undrugged as they were operated on, and surgeries needed to be fast as a result. One in four people died after their surgery, whether it was still on the operating table or from infections afterwards. But what about our buddy I mentioned, Dr. Liston? Only 1 in 10 of his patients died. This was because of his speed. Time me gentlemen, time me, he'd shout to the surgery spectators to put his legendary speed to the test. Sure, he did accidentally castrate somebody once because of his wild motions, but nobody's perfect. In fact, while he's remembered for being the first surgeon to use anesthesia, wash his knives, and invent a still used medical tool, he is the only surgeon to ever have a 300% death rate. I'd be remiss not to mention that during a leg amputation, his lightning speed reportedly cut off three fingers of the assistant who had been holding down the patient. Then as he brought the knife back up, he slashed the coat of a spectator. The spectator reportedly died immediately of fright, likely a heart attack. Though the assistant and patient survived initially, like most who were treated in Victorian hospitals, they died not long after from infection, which was also just called hospitalism at the time because of how many people died that way. It's easy to say that going to a Victorian Victorian surgery or a hospital may have been as efficient as rubbing dirt into a wound. When prescribed this medicine, you'd probably ask yourself, whale I stay or whale I go? This article from 1899 reports on a hotel in Australia where you could go for rheumatoid arthritis treatments. What makes it so special, you may ask? What will you get at this supposed Airbnb to earn a five star from you? Well, the so called treatment at the so called hotel could only happen whenever a nearby whale died. A bunch of dudes on boats would go up to the floating whale, bring her closer to the coast for easier corpse access, and then dig coffin sized holes into its body. Why? Oh, you know, so patients could be rowed up to the whale and cozy on into one of the carcass coffin holes for a couple hours. This process allegedly relieves soreness and inflammation of extreme arthritis cases. But what may be the best part is the treatment was reportedly to be discovered by a drunken man who was staggering along the beach near the whaling station of Twofold Bay and who seeing a dead whale cut open took a header into the decomposing blubber. And to follow up on decomposing animal medicine, let's do some more decomposing animal medicine. Chinese baby, Chinese baby mouse wine, yes you heard me correctly, however it's not only been found in China, having spread to Korea, Kazakhstan and a few other of the Asianic countries. Can't swallow a tequila worm, imagine accidentally chugging down a small mammal. Whoops haha, just gotta go puke my entire body out of my nose really quick. But apparently this potent health tonic is said to combat anything from asthma to liver disease. In order to make the concoction, you'll need between 10 and 15 baby mice, no more than 2 or 3 days old before their demise. Apparently their death age is super important for the quality of the wine, as is the fact baby mice should be furless and have their eyes closed. After which, the recipe states that the mouse body should be submerged in rice wine and left to ferment for a period of 12 to 14 months before the drink is ready to consume. Although in ancient tradition, baby mice wine has few fans due to the uh, reminiscent taste of raw gasoline, but its ethical record isn't exactly squeaky clean either. Ancient India brought us couching, the ancient practice of sitting on your ass. In reality, the couching I'm referring to would have you on the edge of your seat, not kicking back in it. A leading cause of blindness worldwide is cataracts, which affect 24 million Americans aged 40 and over. Ancient Indians developed the first documented treatment for cataracts called couching. It's first documented back in the 6th century BC 
pregnancy by the surgeon Shushruta, who had learned from ancient Egyptian experiments with cataracts. Over the years, the procedure was later used by the Greeks, Romans, Ottomans, and Europeans. During couching, physicians punctured the eye and manually dislodged and removed its cloudy lens. The result was the patient is only able to see movement or basic shapes, now though the cloudiness is gone. Unsurprisingly, this method often led to complications and not the intended outcome. You know, blindness can be a thing if you're jamming unsterilized crap in people's eyes without any formal training. In the mid 1700s, credited with revolutionizing cataract surgery, Frenchman Jacques Daviel made a major advancement when using a knife, blunted needle, and spatula, and he extracted the cataract through an incision in the cornea, the first ever ECCE procedure. Don't worry guys, it's only getting more gnarly from here. Next is milk transfusions, which is gonna go super fast because I literally can't even think about this one for long. So, in the late 19th century, milk was believed to be the perfect substitute for blood, and the fatty slash oily qualities in it would magically become white blood cells. Makes sense, right? Milk is white, women and cows produce milk, and babies, and out of all the animal udders out there, they're the most similar to human udders, so I mean, maybe it all ties in. Maybe it's all related. You know, old timey logic. However, while a few instances of this procedure were successful somehow, many resulted in death, which is a lot more realistic to hear. In one instance, the injection of milk dropped the patient's pulse immediately to the point they had to be resurrected with a combination of morph and whiskey. The patient only lived 10 days after the operation. Shocker. Ah, who's hungry? Anyone hungry? Got some yellow soup here for ya, because any food named after a color because it's also that color gives the energy of playing restaurant with a third grader. And similar to the table service skills of a third grader, yellow soup was crap. Quite literally. In China, the medical use of fecal matter, fresh or dry, can be dated back to the 4th century BC. A total of 54 fecal medicines were found in 14 traditional Chinese medical systems. All of their names, original species, medicinal forms, and traditional uses were described in detail. These fecal medicines were commonly used to treat gastrointestinal issues, nervous system, skin, and other diseases. A 4th century Chinese doctor, Gi Hong, first had the idea of giving a potion made up of healthy person crap by mouth as treatment to someone with unhealthy person crap, such as severe diarrhea or food poisoning, and it may help cure them. Our boy Guy tested his theory and served up some dried, healthy dung in a soup mix. According to numerous accounts, this remedy was an ancient attempt at what is now called fecal microbiota transplantation. And it worked. The good crap bacteria fought the bad gut bacteria. Today, the therapy is used to combat persistent infections which lead to uncontrolled diarrhea and abdominal aches, serious enough to impact quality of life. However, you don't gotta drink it like you used to. It can be an anema, colonoscopy, or suppository. Number five, moles migraines. The use of dead moles as a remedy for migraines was based on certain folk belief and traditions. Now, it was believed that the properties of a dead mole could help alleviate the pain with your migraine. Somehow, in some way, shape, or form. We're just gonna grind up a mole and see what happens. What method involved doing such? One method, you had to dry the mole and then grind it into a fine powder. This powder was then either consumed orally or mixed with water. It's like the worst crystal light ever. You'd be shaking that for hours before it looks good. Or this powder was applied topically to your temple or your forehead. Just dead mole rat powder. Smells great. It was thought that the potent energy or the mystical qualities possessed by the mole would be transferred to this individual, providing relief from migraines. However, do I have to say it anymore? No, it didn't work. The use of dead moles as treatment for migraines lacks scientific evidence and it's not supported at all today. Because yeah, imagine rolling up to the doctors and he starts grinding up a mole rat. He's like, what is it today, your foot? Is your foot hurting? No problem, we'll get you all sorted out. Number four. Medieval dung. We talked about number one, now we have gotta talk about number two. That's the order it comes in. In medieval times, dung, animal feces, was occasionally used as an ingredient for these treatments. I know, where is he gonna put it this time? This practice may seem a little odd to us today, but hear me out, it had some legs back then. It had some prevailing medical theories and limited understanding, but it was something. Dung, poop, animal poop, was believed to possess these medical properties such as its supposed ability to draw out toxins, stimulate healing, or serve as a topical and a septic. It was used in various forms, most commonly in ointment, and was applied to wounds, ulcers, skin conditions, you name it, man, get creative. Whatever hurts, put some poop on it. Yeah, welcome to these times. Animal dung, such as, you know, the dung from cows or pigeons, it was commonly used due to its availability. Yeah, you thought urine was bad, but it gets worse. Pigeon poop for your elbow? I'm like, I don't know, man, this doesn't seem very good. 
Number three, mercury. Mercury, yeah, the element. Let's do this. In ancient times, mercury was used as a medicine due to its perceived healing properties. Now, this was an element, okay? It's not poo, it's not pee, it's something. It's something legit in the scientific community. It was believed to have a range of therapeutic effects, including treating infections, skin conditions, and even mental disorders. All that in a drop of mercury. How lucky are you? Mercury was applied topically or ingested orally, it's so terrible, with the idea that it could purify the body and balance your humors and promote overall well-being <laughs> with the element mercury, of course. However, the use of mercury in ancient medicine was based on horrible, incomplete knowledge, and its toxicity was not fully understood at the time. Yeah, don't eat that. Don't put that anywhere near you. Prolonged exposure to mercury often results in severe health complications, including neurological damage. So if you have a headache, don't go back in time. That's pretty much it. Trepanation. Ancient trepanation, also known as trephination. If you want to be all fancy, throw that the fancy pH in there. It was a surgical procedure in which a hole was drilled or scalped into the skull. Now this practice dates back thousands and thousands of years and it was performed in various ancient cultures for some reason. It was believed to serve different purposes, including relieving headaches, treating skull fractures, while well, creating one, or my personal favorite, releasing evil spirits. Evil spirits, yes, finally, be gone. Trepanation was performed using crude tools and horrible techniques, often without anesthesia. So you'd be awake to feel most of it, at least. The motivations behind trepanation in ancient times remained a subject of debate, encompassing medical, religious, and cultural factors. And also Saw 3. I think it's a little bit of Saw 3 in that one, for sure. That's terrifying. And finally, number one, it's all in your head. In the ancient Babylonian world, illnesses were commonly connected to, you guessed it, supernatural forces. Yep, next time you get a sore throat, it's the devil, nothing else. Malevolent spirits or divine retribution, all because you're sick. As a result, the role of Babylonian healers resembled that of priests and exorcists more than modern physicians, which is so silly. The treatments incorporated elements of magic and ritualistic practices. For instance, if a patient exhibited teeth grinding, this healer would interpret that as a sign of a deceased family member attempting to communicate to them during sleep. So in turn, they're Mm, they're drawing, you know, they're trying to talk back, I guess. Drawing from ancient necromantic texts, the healer would prescribe a peculiar remedy. The patient was then advised to sleep next to a human skull for an entire week. To ensure the effectiveness of this unsettling treatment, the tooth grinder, this mm, Mr. Talky Talk, he was instructed to kiss and lick the skull seven times every night. Which, I mean, first of all, terrible for your sleep. You're not gonna get a wink with that schedule. But also disgusting. Whose head is this? I have so many questions. Why? This is a fetish. This isn't enough. A, a practice? These rituals demonstrate the intricate blend of spiritual beliefs and medical practices that characterize Babylonian healthcare. Growing up, I had a humidifier, so almost the same thing, kind of the same as a human skull. Number 10, mummies. This should come as no surprise to anyone, but yeah, mummies. Well, not the first and not the last civilization to mummify their friends and family, ceasing to exist, they are probably most known for it. Well, that and maybe the pyramids. The Pyramids are pretty cool, I guess. The process of mummifying or preserving the body was thought to be important for the soul during the afterlife. If the vessel or your body was not intact, then your soul could get lost. Therefore, if you want the pharaoh to live forever in the afterlife, then you must pickle and preserve the mighty king. I don't want my soul getting lost. Number 9. 40 Year Old's Worst Nightmare Despite my best efforts and anti-aging cream, there will come a time when I will be old. Personally, I'm not worried about putting some mileage on. That's life. However, something I am concerned about is the effects of aging. Have you ever just noticed that he ain't as limber as he used to be? You get tired easily. And if you have more than three beers, you have to lay down for three days. However, something that happens to a lot of men reaching their 40s is a little trouble in the bedroom. This was an issue in ancient Egypt, except sadly, there wasn't a messed up process to fix impotence. I know, right? That's crazy. You thought I was gonna say something weird like wrap a snake around it or something, but no. When in modern times, the cute waitress at the golf clubhouse just doesn't get your blood pumping anymore, you could reach for a small blue pill that everybody knows. Egyptians did not possess such luxuries and instead prayed for the Pisha deal to work. Dear Desert Jeebus, please make my wiener work again. Thank you. Number eight, ahead of their time. Ancient Egyptians just may have been ahead of their time and didn't know it. The Egyptians had tons of different herbs, plants, and methods for treating all kinds of ailments. Their alchemy skill was maxed out. 
I never did that. However, one method they came up with may have been helping more than they thought. A porridge mixture that was boiled down that contained tetracycline, which just in case you didn't know, is known as an antibiotic. This would have been very helpful for the time, as a scrape on the knee could be the difference between living and well, not living. While this was being used, it's unsure if the Egyptians really knew why this method worked. We doubt they understood the finite details of antibiotics, and I'm not going to stand here and pretend that I do either, because I don't. Number 7. Tales from the Crypt Keeper <laughs> You didn't think I was going to talk about mummies and not talk about how they make them, right? Hold on to your spittoons, this is going to be a rough one. Okay, so we all know that when we pass on, our bodies begin to decay and break down. The Egyptians knew this, so they would have to be one step ahead if they were to have the king pickled in time for the afterlife. Well, first things first, the brains? They gotta go. They would remove the brain with a large spike and sort of just sort of mash it up there and just well then they drain the contents from the nose, which that is just disgusting. Stomach, colon, and lungs, well, those won't be needed in the afterlife either, so they gotta go too. But the heart? The heart stays though. That's where the soul is. The king was then dried out with mounds of alkaline salt and the world's best beef jerky impression. Afterwards, oils were rubbed into the skin and eventually a resin was applied to aid in the linen wrap sticking to the body. Making for that distinct Tupperware brand airtight seal. The pickled king was wrapped numerous more times just to be safe and then, if he was OG enough, placed into a sarcophagus. And if you're really cool, you'll get your own room full of gold and treasures and your pet whiskers which is a cat, and be mummified because, well, you need him in the afterlife too. That is one heck of an undertaking process. And to be fair, it kind of worked, because there have been a few mummies recovered from Egypt, and they're in amazing condition, considering the age, of course. Number six, a little off the top. Okay, without the comment section oversharing here, some people have had circumcisions and some haven't. It's a part of life, okay? Just. That's how it goes. Debatable to some, but it happens. This was a common practice in ancient Egypt, claimed to be for hygiene reasons. However, there's something a little bit different about their process. See, today it happens when you're a baby. A strange man comes in the room, and he cuts what he has to cut. It's done, there it is. That's it, it's over. Egyptians waited a little longer, however, closer to the age of 12 or 13. Can you imagine just chilling in the field one day and then some strange dude grabs you and slaps you down on the table and makes a withdrawal from you to make you veg? I talked to the chief today and he just said that's that's not it. Don't don't do that. Face washing brought in controversial hand washing. Contrary to popular belief, some groups of the medieval people actually wash their hands multiple times a day. Jewish people in particular made sure to wash their hands before eating and Christians adopt did the same practice, but even unreligious peoples would sometimes wash their hands after eating, since a lot of people didn't own utensils, and wiping your hands on fabric ain't always gonna do it. Case in point, honey garlic wings. In upper class families, guests specifically were always requested to wash their hands by pouring water out of a pitcher called an aquamanil, which was poured over a basin. These aquamanils were often in the shape of lions or people or mythical creatures, however, no one was washing to the extent of using soap for 20 seconds. The Water in these small pitchers needed to be shared among a large group of people, so people in the Middle Ages simply splashed water on their hands before drying and poured the dirty water right back in to wash someone else's fingers later. But you'd think that soap would be involved, especially because endless people essentially had a dark age Etsy store. Today, soap is made out of essentially the same products every time. Back in the Middle Ages though, people used a lot of different substances in a cauldron like witches making a potion just trying to produce some semblance of soapy stuff that don't smell bad. Most successful was a combination of lime, wood ash, lard and oil. Black soap, aka soft soap, gets its name from the dark color of the wood ash lye used to make it, and the cast iron it was often boiled in. Hard soap was made with high quality barilla ashes, which creates a light colored lye. Therefore, white soap quickly became equated with high quality hard soap. The stiff soap was then molded into cakes and bars, added dried flowers to the outer side, and the quality and scent of the soap changes depending on how wealthy someone is. Unfortunately, in case you didn't catch the keyword in there a few times, folks made soap with lye, which is so harsh it can 
remove skin if you scrub a little too hard. Next is how the world could have had toilet paper faster if they weren't judgy wipers. China had toilet paper figured out as early as the 6th century, making small squares of rice paper that would decompose into the ground and take the feces with it. Pretty eco-friendly stuff. However, the Europeans found this to be horrifying because they thought it was disgusting that the Chinese only wiped without actually washing their backside with water. Meanwhile in Europe, they're using a communal sponge on a stick that sat in a bucket of water that wouldn't be changed all day, so please tell me which is more unsanitary and horrifying. In medieval Europe, people sometimes used devices called gonfus or a gonf stick as well as a torchicool or a torch cut. The gonf sticks were sponges on a stick as described, while the torchicool was anything to wipe the bottom. Like straw or moss or leaves or wood. You know, the basics. Who has time to care about eye bags though when you're walking around wearing a gag preventer nose bag? Even though medieval people clean their bodies a, a little bit more than you'd imagine, that doesn't mean the towns were sparkling clean. When you stepped outside you came face to face with human waste, rotting food, and trash riddled streets. Horses regularly relieved themselves on the street as did the live animals in the markets and so did the people. Also animals just kind of died in places and people would leave them there. Add in the smell of mold from straw houses and the smell of diseased human or animal skin and sometimes even corpses, these bad smells were at their worst in cities and large towns. Things were so incredibly smelly people nearly gagged, especially when it all began to bake under the hot summer sun and heat. So in order to combat the smell, some people wore nose bags, which were fabric like masks that were filled with flowers and other fragrances that would be able to help the stomach smell the streets filled with waste. Men and women would put noses in the nose bag, give them a huff, and life is good again. The lesson here, be thankful for breeze and use it. And of course, the weirdest for last, the ear spoon. Sounds promising, doesn't it? While nowadays people use q-tips to clean your ears, which apparently we aren't even supposed to be doing, as cringe worthy as it sounds, people use long wooden or metal spoons called ear spoons or ear picks to remove the wax. Ear picks were also frequently made of bone, ivory, and brass as purely utilitarian items. Archaeologists have found them amongst the Vikings primarily, where it was common for them to carry an ear spoon on a chain around their neck so that they never have to be without their little tool should they ever have to degunk themselves. Ear spoons were used by all levels of society in medieval and post medieval England following the Tudors. The 17th century English knew about plaque, which they called scale, and they were encouraged by their doctors to scrape their teeth frequently. So these little doodads expanded to include that purpose. And how could I not mention that while a tailor normally would use beeswax to coat thread and make it stronger and easier to use, with no bees available, earwax would do. As gross as it may seem to us today, earwax was worth saving and selling. And coming in at number 10, baths. From bath bombs to jacuzzis, when did people exactly start warming up that cold river water to sit in for some R&R? &R? Well, apparently the Romans were the first to think about warming her up. I don't really know if they had it in mind that warm water works better and faster to clean and rid of microparticles and had more of a oh, mentality, but one way or another they did it. Were they really ahead of their time though? The first bathhouses have been discovered in Rome approximately being built somewhere in the 2nd century BC, the first of its kind from a river of cold water to the abundance of over 500 steaming prominent bathhouses. You could pamper yourself head to toe for a small price, small enough so that even the poorest could bathe. That's a lot of small business owners. Hottest water in town, step right up, step right up. The Romans came up with an idea to build a spa house thing which could be flooded and heated by the floor beneath it. With a giant fireplace inside the spa, it was lit by hand and blown through the vents under the floor. Damn, they were smart, huh? Hot and steamy and good for the body. And clean. Well, cleaner. The bathhouse was a technology of its own and it seemed like humanity was headed in the right direction. No, no they were not. Number 9. Wiping. Do as the Romans did. It's thought that these people thought of literally everything before us. Oh yeah? How about pogo sticks? Think of that? Huh? pogo -onitis? No. No you didn't. Look that up, did they? Over the years I've had some pretty shitty jobs but nothing as shitty as this one. Literally. Uh, sire, would you like fronteth to backeth or backeth to fronteth today, sire? That's right, there was a job for that. People had to have had started wiping at some point, right? But who exactly and when? The groom of the stool, chief gentlewoman of the privy chamber. Call it whatever you like, we know what they did. So what exactly did they wipe with? Well, usually hay, sticks, fur, or even seashells. 
Every single one of those sounds itchy and terrible. I know what Charmin can do sometimes, and I can't imagine what a piece of oak could have done back then. Was there splinter taker routers as well? I can't help but feel, although, how painful and stinky it was. I'm sure there was at least one shared laugh, a little quality time spent with some royalty to say the least. Although this career is speculated, both King Charles I and King James I had them, so unless they decided they wanted to do that after them, someone must have continued doing it. I hope for a pretty penny at least. Those waste management dudes have pretty good benefits. Filing your taxes looking for a job description? Uh, ah, yes, here it is, wiper. Number eight, urine. Okay, is this just gonna be disgusting the entire time? Well, the answer is yes. History's pretty disgusting. Okay, this one is weird because right when we think we figured it all out, something jarring happens, like a jar of piss and all the health benefits it had throughout history. Uh, I'm sorry, what? Well, at least they thought it did. In ancient Rome, not only was this liquid gold sold for, well, gold, it was often traded as a prominent good, sold for its multitude of healing purposes. You see, people have been using urine for thousands of years. That's right, this destructive, toxic bodily fluid could be repurposed, salvaged into many different topicals and treatments. From hair loss to your daily skincare routine, it was not only great for staining and softening leather made for shoes and clothes, it was a natural teeth whitener, an antiseptic. <laughs> That's right, from ancient Rome to as late as the 20th century, people have been tinkering and tailoring with their pee. Egyptians did it, Greeks did it, Urine is the body's natural antiseptic and was soon turning septic. Like the science behind this alone is what your buddy tells you, you know what I mean? Oh, rolled ankle? Yeah, yeah, just piss on it. Got ghosts? Ah, just pee on it. The ailment for all your needs. Disgusting. Number seven, teeth. Invented in 1488 by Sir Robert Tooth. Okay, I'm joking, no. Teeth were never officially invented, but what we did for them and how we cared for them had people scratching their heads for the last millennia. We've all had a toothache at some point in our lives, so they must have had them back then. In fact, oral hygiene was utterly disgusting. I didn't brush my teeth after my coffee and I can already feel it. Ew. People's teeth were so bad throughout history that dentists were actually training and teaching each other what to do about the huge toothworm problem. That's right. Imagine worms growing inside your teeth. Well, due to the swelling and pressure, people thought there were actual bugs or evil spirits living within their sore tooth, serving them extreme pain. Nope, just an infection. You need a root canal. Oh, and actual worms and bugs living in the tooth. Uh, yeah, you see this gray area right here? Uh, that's a ladybug, right? It's medieval England and things were pretty medieval. Right down to the surgery and if you had an impacted wisdom tooth, well, that wasn't covered. England, 400 AD. People started this new trend of oral hygiene cleaning but it wasn't spin brushes and floss, no more like mint and vinegar and prayer. Just kind of swoosh it all around in your mouth and wipe your teeth with your shirt and call it another year. If you were lucky enough to rinse your mouth out at the time, then you could have saved yourself a visit to the medieval dentist chair. Well, actually just a slab of rock you sit up against and have a friend who's good at ripping. And there you go, buddy. Hey, wake up. The infection alone from the dirty tools going into your mouth is making me itchy. I feel like my breath stinks more now after I've read this topic. Anybody have any gum? Number six. Toilet paper. Finally, something we recognize. Invented originally in China in 851 from the Tang Dynasty, these soft fabric sheets were designed for, well, you know what it was designed for, but yes, mostly the emperor's bathroom breaks and soon caught on for the commonwealth as well. The higher the class, the softer and more luxurious the material. From leather to silk, butts were seeing a kinder, gentler side of hygiene. Two ply bark versus four ply silk. The use of toilet paper throughout Europe is a messy one. Again, wipers and hay and stuff like that. It wasn't until the toilet paper rule created by Joseph Gaiety in 1857 that this hygiene method would solidify and stay for keeps. The classic under versus over is the tale as old as time. You ever want to get into a quick argument at someone's house? Just peek in the loo, see if they're rocking beard or mullet. It's the simplest way to have a know-it-all show you the patent and tell you how to wipe your own ass. Charmin. At number 10, bloodletting. Back in the medieval age, medicine just wasn't the greatest. I mean, they had a plague that wiped out 50% of the population in Europe, and even their quote-unquote doctors were overlapping jobs. Barbers were cutting hair, obviously, but they were also setting broken bones and bandaging wounds, and I'm not sure I would really trust that, but back then it was a case of you get what you get. So I guess people weren't complaining all that much about their barber Joey from down the street giving them a cast, you know? 
But other than the practice of patching wounds and whatnot, they were also practicing bloodletting back then, and it was a little much. Bloodletting was a practice of withdrawing blood in order to cure or prevent diseases or illnesses, so doctors would use things like leeches to suck blood out of their patients, but they also used scarification methods to scrape away the skin to drain the blood, and others used lancets to slice open veins, sometimes including the jugular vein. I'm so glad that we don't do this anymore because frankly, I would like my blood to stay inside of my body. Thank you. At number nine, the king's evil. Being a king or queen in the medieval ages might seem like a cool job, but I don't really think it was. With the rivalries that these people had, they were at risk of being assassinated in one way or another. They had to worry about their bloodlines and of course, that thing that everyone had to deal with, illness. Some kings, to help out their people, were tasked with healing an illness called the king's evil, and you're probably thinking, well, these kings aren't doctors, how did they cure illnesses? And to that I say, well, they touched it, of course. This whole thing started in the 11th century, when Edward the Confessor became known for touching a person that was suffering from scrofula, aka the king's evil, and curing them. People thought that this was a miracle, and so for hundreds of years after that, English and French monarchs were tasked with touching the sick to cure them of this illness, because monarchs were believed to be an incarnation of the divine. Before we carry on talking about some of the bizarre medical practices from the medieval age, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number eight, tooth worms. If you're one of those people who really hate going to the dentist, just be glad that you didn't have to go to the dentist during the medieval ages because that was an absolute nightmare and a half. Not only because they had no proper medicine or anesthetics, but because you could also get the worst diagnosis you could ever get, a diagnosis of an infection of toothworms. They believed that people could be infected with toothworms that caused a tooth decay and pits and holes in the tooth were home to a worm that looked like a tiny eel. What's worse than the diagnosis, however, was the removal process. They didn't want to pull out the tooth that was supposedly infected with these tiny worms, so instead they used a more holistic approach. A method that they would use to get rid of the worm would be to take a candle that was made of sheep's fat and various seeds, and they would hold it as close to the tooth as possible so that the worm would run out from heat and fall into a little dish of water that was being held beneath the person's mouth. That sounds like a horrible trip to the dentist, that's for sure. At number seven, pee reading. Now this might not be considered a surgery, but this medieval age tradition was probably one of the strangest medical practices I have ever heard. In medieval England, people were known to get diagnosed based on their pee. Back then, they believed that the consistency, color, and taste of someone's pee could diagnose someone's ailments. They took this method of diagnosis so seriously that they published books for the wealthy so that they could do this practice at home, and these books included illustrations and color charts so that they knew how to judge their own pee. According to their text, if your pee was white, then it was the ideal color, and that meant that everything was working just fine. If it was wine colored like blue or black, then that meant that something was very wrong. And if it was green, then you were basically on your last leg and you should probably get your will in order. Now, I'm not sure how accurate these readings actually were since medicine was basically non-existent back then, but they tried their best with what they had, I guess. However, I'm pretty sure you don't need a book to tell you that if your pee is wine colored, that's a bad thing. At number six, eye surgery. Our eyes are very sensitive, which is why it's so important to keep them healthy. Oftentimes when something is wrong with our eyes, we naturally go and get them fixed. But back in the medieval age, if something was wrong with your eyes, you really had to think long and hard about whether or not you really wanted to get them fixed because the procedure to fix your eyes sounded like an absolute nightmare. Back then when someone had cataracts, a surgical procedure called needling was performed and it involved having a doctor push a thick black needle into the patient's cornea. Remember, there was no anesthesia back then, so you were just raw dogging this entire experience. After the procedure was completed, the patient would usually be left with an unfocused eye, described to be similar to a camera without a lens. That didn't necessarily matter to everyone, because while it would be hard to read the Bible, it would still be okay to plow a field, and as long as they could work, that's really all that mattered. 